The new online game Circuit is gaining incredible popularity breaking records in numbers, all thanks to the recreation of perfect virtual reality. Even people who weren't interested at first quickly got swept up in the new experience. The protagonist of the story, Lee Kiho with the nickname Mose, is also one of the players. Suddenly he is pulled out of his thoughts by a loud shout. It's the other players who insist that if he's going to stand around and do nothing, then he'd better go away because he's interfering with their hunting. Mose is what's known as a slime cleaner. The popularity of the game has led to the fact that in-game currency has more importance than the one in real life. Items in the game have three ranks, normal, magic, and rare. These items add stat points, and the stats translate into player power, which is the reason for the high monetary value of the items. By gaining one level in the game, you gain one point to the stats, so if you put on an item that adds one point, it's like gaining a whole level. Even one point significantly increases skills. If a person wears a ring that gives three points of strength, then he will be able to hit with the strength of a professional boxer. This is why items that add even just one point can cost tens of thousands of dollars. But what about rare rank items? Rare rank items have never yet appeared in the game. Their status, and whether there are even higher ranks is shrouded in mystery. So the magic rank is currently the best. The slimes that the main character hunts are the easiest monsters that can drop magic items, but the chance for it to drop is very low. People who hunt only slime in the hope of getting a good item are also known as slime cleaners. That's the case with Moe's, who hasn't managed to get any good items for more than two months. After another unsuccessful day, he heads to the nearby town of Linderoke to at least sell the low-value items he has managed to get. But he soon finds that for everything he has acquired, the merchant offers him only 20 silver. That's because due to the large number of people hunting for slimes, the prices of materials have dropped significantly. In fact, their value halved in just one day. Mose is heartbroken over his failure in the game. If he converts the 20 silver that he earned into real money, it comes out to less than $20. And to make matters worse, because of the large number of people hunting, the number of slimes has decreased significantly. For two whole months he hunted only for slimes hoping for a magic item. But in all that time he only managed to earn five gold coins. And all he has is beginner's equipment, which will soon be completely destroyed. And the new weapon costs even more. Disappointed, Moe silently ponders the meaning of his existence and curses this stupid game. All he wanted was to give his best for two months and get some money to pay for college. Eventually, after much thought, Moe decides to give up the game for good. However, he doesn't want to just leave, he wants to leave with style. At the same time, a large crowd has gathered nearby. It seems that something really strange is happening there. Suddenly pink smoke appears, and a man standing in the middle holds a fish in his hand, and the fish has the face of a man. Seeing this, all the people around him burst into loud laughter, saying that it is some ordinary junk item. It appears to be some kind of item lottery. Attracted by the crowd, Mose makes his way to a place where an item can be drawn for the value of five gold coins. The man in charge of the minigame suggests that he should give it a try, as he senses a lot of luck from him. The man confesses that he has been waiting for someone like Mose for a very long time. The problem is that he directed exactly the same words to a previous participant of his game. Mose nevertheless decides to take a chance since he is going to give up the game anyway. However, he didn't open the surprise in front of all these people. Instead, he moved to a room in a nearby inn to experience his last moments in the game in peace. Mose also realizes that because he has been hunting for slimes all this time, he doesn't really have any other memories of the game. In the end, Mose decides to open the surprise and finally say goodbye to this world. As he opens it, the object emanates with incredible energy, and a puzzled Mose notices that it looks a bit different from what he's seen before. And as it turns out, the object that showed up is a necklace. Star of Polarun, that's the name of the necklace, which to Moses' great surprise turns out to be an item of rare rank. Latest news from Circuit. The latest hot topic is the Inus Ring, which was sold for $72,000. This magical ring adds plus 4 to life regeneration. It dropped from a high-level monster in the northern region. Life regeneration is the rarest effect, and this is why the price of the ring reached such a great value. In the next place was an item with an effect that is also found rather rarely. It's a necklace that adds plus 3 strength, which sold for $39,000. Until recently, Moe's had listened to the news with undisguised astonishment. But now, 
he has officially become the owner of a rare Polarun necklace that adds so many effects that it's hard to even put a value on it. Mose can't believe his luck. For just the five gold he had managed to score a truly amazing item. At the same moment, Mose realizes an important question. How much could such a necklace be worth? After a quick calculation, he concludes that the value of the necklace must be between one and two million. College fees are no longer a problem, he can even buy a new apartment and even a great car. But when Mose decides at the first moment to sell the necklace and opens an auction house, at the same moment he begins to doubt his initial decision. Usually, an item that adds three or five points to your strength makes you feel like a completely different person. And he had trouble even killing weak slimes. If he decides to wear the necklace, he might even be able to become a high-ranking player. Currently, Moses' stats leave much to be desired. We can also say that he is just weak. Eventually, he decides to wear it. As soon as Mose puts the necklace around his neck, something strange happens, and he begins to feel a great pain in his body. This seems to be the price to pay for the sudden increase in stats by 18 levels. However, thanks to the increase in strength, Mose is even able to bend a coin in his fingers without any problem. But what else will he be able to do thanks to the necklace? The center of the continent is the place from which you can easily access any region. There is always a large number of players in this area, so it's always easy to find a team to raid. This area is also home to the largest city in the game, the great city of Asparagon. Mose feels uncomfortable in a city full of players with very good equipment. He himself doesn't really have anything of value except for a necklace that even can't be seen. He decides to look for a rather solo task. At this very moment, a girl approaches him. Her name is Sharon. Sharon notices that Mose is looking for a team. She says they have one empty spot and asks if he wants to go with them. Mose, after a short thought, agrees, and soon the two of them are heading towards the rest of Sharon's team. The rest of the girl's group is surprised to see that the girl has brought a person with beginner's equipment. But Sharon has an ability that allows her to see the strength of other players, which is why she decided to recruit Mose. As everyone gets acquainted with the new team member, an unexpected voice sounds behind their backs. It turns out that the voice belongs to Silberun, the player who is one of the best, plays mage, and is the leader of the famous Silver Guild. It seems that with the arrival of Mose, the entire raid group is practically ready to start the mission. It turns out that Mose, without even realizing it, has decided to take part in the troll hunt. Despite being a lower level monster, trolls have high regeneration power the power to destroy a boulder with one hand, and usually attack in a group. Mose begins to doubt if he has come to the right place, and is unsure if he can handle such a difficult mission. Fortunately, as the other members of the new team quickly explain, the troll's weaknesses are fire, curses, and the fact that they are quite slow however. Mose is still worried because he has no experience in fighting trolls, or any monsters stronger than slimes. Materials extracted from trolls are needed to make good quality armor and potions, which is why troll hunts are usually organized by large guilds. That's why players with lower levels, such as in Moses' team, rarely have the opportunity to take part in such a mission, and everyone is grateful for the chance. What's more, it looks like the rumors are true, and the Silver Guild is really looking for new members. That's why everyone is ready to give it their all. Finally, it's time to explain the plan for the raid. The plan is to lure the trolls into the traps previously set up by silver guild members, and then have the guild members kill the weakened monster. Trolls are much slower than humans, so with preparation and this plan, the hunt should go off without any problems. Mose wanted to test his new stats, but it looks like he won't have the opportunity to fight any trolls this time. The team that Mose joined isn't entirely happy with the task distribution, because according to the plan, the best rewards will go to the silver guild. There is not a single guild member in the group responsible for attracting trolls. All silver guild members are in the hit group. Therefore, they are likely to get a much larger portion of items and rewards after the raid. Nonetheless, Moses' team is not complaining, and they are happy that at least they have a chance to take part in the mission. Perhaps even a magic item will drop. The hunt begins. Unfortunately, very soon three players while luring trolls fall into a trap. Silver Guild members, instead of helping the players, only observe the whole situation from close range and have no intention of helping them at all. The players die at the hands of the monsters, and only then, Silberin kills the trolls. It turns out that Silver's Guild only decided to take advantage of the other players, 
let them die. And thus all the rewards from the mission will go directly to the guild. At the same time, Mose and his team are extremely unlucky, and meet a boss on their way. Black Mountain. This is the name of the leader of the trolls. Mose is paralyzed seeing the huge monster, and is unable to react in time to avoid the incoming attack. Fortunately, the quick thinking of a member of the group who is a tank, saves Mose and Sharon. Tank uses his shield ability to defend them. But despite his best efforts, and excellent defense, the strength of the boss is just too great, and the man flies a few meters away. Mose is horrified. He has never personally met a troll, but what stands before him, has absolutely nothing to do with the things he has heard from others. The troll in front of them emits such a strong bloodlust, that it can be easily sensed. Mose is convinced that he is about to die. Fortunately, this is not the first hunt of the other members of the team, and a hail of arrows fired by Sharon soon falls on the troll. Immediately after, a tank arrives, and using his large shield, deals the troll a blow straight to the head, while using one of his skills, Shield Bash. Under the impact of the momentum, the huge troll flies far away like a ragdoll. Or at least it seems so because the huge opponent regained his balance very quickly, and what's worse, now he was really pissed off. Despite all these attacks, the monster suffered completely no damage. In fact, it's only now that Moses' team realizes that they've met a hidden boss that no one really considered. The monster is much stronger and faster than ordinary trolls, so getting it to the trap as planned will simply be impossible. Not seeing many options, Moses' team decides to withstand the monster's attacks until Silver's guild members show up. The situation does not look good. Everyone tries to attack the boss, but their attacks have no effect. Mose begins to doubt himself, and feels that he shouldn't be in the place he ended up in. It's all due to his inexperience in playing circuit. The other members of the team work perfectly together, and he has no idea what to do. After all, he has been mindlessly killing nothing but slimes for two whole months. He also begins to regret the fact that he didn't go on adventures earlier using what the game offers. Perhaps then he would have met the right people and been able to experience real adventures. Moses snapped out of his thoughts by a shout from one of the team members. Black Mountain once again attacks him, but fortunately, the tank jumps to the rescue this time as well. Mose wonders if someone like him can change. Frustrated by the wasted time in the game and wanting to do more, Mose raises his sword and attacks the monster with all his might. Unfortunately, the durability of the weapon, which has been low after two months of slime hunting, depletes at the worst moment, and the sword breaks like a stick. In retaliation after the failed attack, the boss hits Mose and sends him flying. Mose receives massive damage, and the durability of the rest of his equipment also drops to zero. However, the monster doesn't intend to stop at all, and quickly attacks the other team members. Even one blow means instant and quick death at the hands of the monster. Tank attacks once again using a shield, and this time he rams it with all his might into the troll's foot. At the same moment, Mose finally comes to his senses and is surprised to wake up. His head hurts, but that's basically it. He is unable to understand why he didn't die. It seems that the magic necklace in his possession worked out well. All the wounds have been healed. So this is the so much sought after effect of healing. He was once again snapped out of his thoughts by the shouting of team members. The fight continues, and everyone bravely faces an opponent much stronger than them. Tank is hit with massive force by a tree, which the troll treats as his new mace. Sharon seizes the opportunity, and at the same moment sends an arrow towards the monster, which plunges straight into its eye. This, however, only leads to the fury of the troll, which now continually packs heavy blows on the tank with all its might. It seems that he won't be able to hold out much longer. At the same moment, the unleashed Mose crashes into his opponent with all his strength, and the heavy momentum sends the monster into the air. Mose, seeing this, is very surprised, because in fact it was just an act of desperation, and he didn't expect his blow to have any effect. The others also can't believe what they just saw. Mose asks if everyone is okay. At the same moment, a bright healing light surrounds the wounded tank. This appears to be another function of the necklace, healing the entire team. Thanks to this, all wounds heal quickly, and the tank, who is one step away from death, has returned to full health. The members of the team begin to suspect that Mose is no ordinary beginner at all. Soon, however, the monster rises after falling, and Mose is given a sword by one of the team members to finish off his opponent. Without a second thought, Mose draws his sword and rushes toward the boss. 
He leaps into the air, and with all his strength slashes the monster right in its head. Silver Guildmaster inventory is filled with various items that fell out of the trolls. Their plan works brilliantly, and if it goes on like this, their earnings will translate into $100,000 per 10 minutes. The task of killing the trolls can be accepted by at least 120 people, so the guild had to gather 80 more people. During such tasks, the automatic distribution of items based on player contributions takes place. Silver Guild Leader's plan was to use other players to lure the trolls to later kill the monsters himself, and get all the items. However, when the Guildmaster quietly counts the profits, at the same moment without warning, a message about the completed quest appeared. The boss. Black Mountain has been killed. No one knows what's going on, and everyone is puzzled. Team number 13 has shown the highest contribution. Silver Guild founder is very surprised because it's not his team. He wasn't the one who made the greatest contribution. It was Moe's, who, with a powerful sword blow, killed the hidden boss thus securing first place for his team. Upon seeing the message, Silberun immediately sent men to attack and capture the team responsible for completing the quest. However, soon after, Silberun and his guild are attacked. The Dark Guild got them, killing all the members of Silver, including Silberun himself at the end, while making fun of how weak he really is. Back in the city of Asparagon, Mose goes to an auction house located in the shopping district. After killing the boss, an item fell out of it, which is called a core. Its function is similar to treasure chests. Cores can vary depending on the monsters they fall out of, and the stronger the monster, the higher the possibility of getting good items. Team members encourage Mose to be the one to open the core since he was the one who killed Black Mountain. A puzzled Mose asks if they are sure, but they don't even want to hear an objection. With the persuasion of the others, Mose finally decides to open the core. A number of useful items fall out of the core, including a ring of strength with magic rank, which the hero decides to sell at the auction house. Mose wonders if 80 gold coins, which translates into $8,000, is a good price, but he can't agree with himself whether he chose the right amount. In the end, Mose puts the ring up for 80 gold coins and prays in his spirit for anyone to make a bid. Soon, Mose finds himself again in a nearby tavern, Tired throws himself on the bed and begins to reflect on everything that happened that day. He killed a very strong boss. He gained many good items, and most importantly, he made his first friends in the game. And it all started with a rare necklace acquired in an item gacha. Moe's leaves the game. Checking his phone, he sees a message from his worried mother, who reminds him to eat well and sends him some money. Checking his bank account, he sees a long list of expenses, but after a while, his mood is improved by a large influx of cash straight from the game. The items put up for sale sold very quickly, and Moe's made over $30,000 in just one day. Getting such an amount of money in circuit motivates the hero to get even more into the game. He planned his expenses, including buying a powder from the circuit store. It is a nutritional supplement for nutrient deficiencies resulting from the inability to eat while playing. It works by making the VR machine release the powder into the body while eating in-game. When browsing the internet, Moe's notices his nickname on the first search. This is related to the fact that he killed a boss, and as a result, one of the guilds is offering as much as 500 gold coins for help in finding the hero. The Dark Guild's killing of Silboran has also been reported on the internet. Moe's feels overwhelmed by this information and the fact that guilds may start fighting over his recruitment. The hero doesn't want his freedom in the game to be taken away and decides to log in right away. Mose decides to leave Asparagon and wait until the recent events have quieted down. In the meantime, he decides to properly prepare himself for his lonely journey and creates armor from the skin of Black Mountain, which has a magic rank and adds quite a few bonuses. With his new acquisition, Mose is ready to set out on his journey. He thanks the goblin who prepared the armor for him and finally leaves the city. On the way, the hero quickly learns that his expedition, however, will not be so easy because he almost immediately loses his way. Then he notices air coming out from under the ground. He touches the place to see what it is, and at that moment the earthquake starts, and after a while before his eyes appear the entrance to a hidden cave. It turns out that Moe's accidentally became the first to discover the new dungeon, the Black Root Cave. The hero makes use of the object that lights the way and enters the cave. After spending a long while traversing the darkened corridors, Moe's begins to feel that the cave drags on endlessly and begins to get mildly stressed. 
Eventually, he encounters a suspicious stone tablet standing on something like an altar in his path. It quickly became apparent that this was no ordinary tablet at all. For as soon as Mose read the words engraved on it, behind his back, undead began to rise from the ground. The tablet was set up with a curse, the activation of which drew the attention of its dead guards. To make matters worse, there were really many of them. An uneven fight begins. Mose throws himself at a group of opponents, but these seem to have no end. In place of each felled opponent, several more appear. This time the situation is really dangerous. Mose has no sword fighting experience, nevertheless, he is able to repel the attacks of skeletons only thanks to his stats. Unfortunately the opponent's numerical superiority is crushing, and not much later Mose is completely cornered by the skeletons throwing themselves at him without restraint. At this point however, there is a burst of energy. It's the result of power accumulated thanks to Mose's unique equipment, equipment that provides him with far more stats than his current level. It doesn't stop there, however, and Mose throws himself back into the fight without a second thought. After a long while, the floor of the cave is covered with the bones of the guards, and Mose is the only one still standing. At the same moment, a notification shows up, and it turns out that thanks to a long and grueling battle, Mose has gained another two levels of his character. The joy doesn't last long. Mose hears a strange sound from a passage in the cave and decides to check it out, just in case. He doesn't know exactly where the sound is coming from, but slowly tries to head in its direction while carefully moving through the cave. At one point when he looks out from behind one of the walls, a horrifying stench reaches him, and its source seems to be the corpses of dead adventurers lying all around. Not far away, in another part of the same room, Mose finds another stone tablet, very similar to the one he came across earlier. Pushed by curiosity, Mose decides to read it without hesitation. It quickly turns out that the mysterious tablet tells a story. It tells of the hatred to the Imperial Army, which committed the arson of the village and the murder of the text author's family. As revenge, the author of the text, the shaman of the village, placed a curse on the army, which imprisoned them as skeletons in this cave for eternity. The tablet differs from the previous one in that it isn't a trap, but a task that involves destroying the cursed commander of the deserters, Jaratan, who was also sealed in the cave. As it turns out, uttering the cursed words, mortal, ivory, skull, activates the quest. Without thinking, Mose utters the cursed words required for activation. Immediately, the bones and remains scattered around the room begin to form into the body of a powerful boss, Jaratan. He is filled with a lust for revenge for the years he spent sealed. The mere presence of the undead was enough for Mose to feel a profound fear of what stood before him. Jaratan asked if Mose was the one who freed him by saying the cursed words. The hero replied that he was, and said he would hold the monster accountable for what he had done to the village. This didn't please the monster. The skeleton quickly attacks with tremendous power, which slams the hero into the wall of the cave. Its strength and fury is overwhelming. Jaratan warns Mose not to even expect to leave this place alive. Named monsters. These are monsters that have a unique name, and are much stronger than ordinary monsters. Although Mose was well aware of this, he didn't expect in the slightest that one Jaratan attack would be so powerful that it would rob him of most of his health bar. Fortunately, thanks to the items he collected, Mose has a great regeneration ability. The hero's healing enrages the monster even more. It attacks again, but this time Mose makes a dodge and performs an effective counterattack that sends the skeletal commander on his back. Something like this would be impossible for an ordinary player, but in the case of Mose, who has acquired amazing items, it's certainly possible. Jaratan can't believe what has happened. He knows that his body is no longer a human body, but he can't bear the thought that an ordinary beginner is causing him such problems. The hero is proud of himself and confident that he can win, but Jaratan is just as motivated to win and free himself from the curse. The monster uses one of its skills and summons the cursed sword while raising its level. It can be said that the battle has entered another phase at this point. Gyratan deals two quick slashes that inflict really serious damage. Without giving Mose time to regenerate, the monster attacks again at the man's exposed back. He is protected from a quick death by his new armor, but the sheer force of the blow makes Mose roll on the ground like a rag doll, eventually hitting a wall. Fortunately, the necklace still works, and Mose's current health regeneration is 100 points per second. His maximum life is 300, 
which means that if he doesn't die from one hit, and lasts at least three seconds, then his life will return to its maximum value. Soon, Moe's is ready to continue fighting. Jeraton doesn't like this development very much, as well as the attitude of the insolent beginner. He attacks once again, this time with a powerful sweep from above. Moe's has trouble taking such a heavy blow, but manages to slightly change its trajectory and jump aside. Thanks to this chance, the hero is able to deal a sufficiently strong blow to the monster, which finally deals damage. However, one blow is not enough, and Moe's doesn't stop swinging his sword, inflicting more and more damage to the monster. Pinned down, Jeraton swings the sword again, but this time Moe's is already prepared, and with one precise cut, cuts off the monster's arm, and not much later sends it on its back again, and puts the sword blade to its neck. This is finally the end of the fight. Jeraton is shocked that someone is able to defeat him, a former swordsman, a golden predator of the honorable imperial army. He believes that Moe's knows nothing about the mentality of a soldier, and has no right to call him a murderer. He says the army had no other choice, and had to kill because of a lack of support and the prevailing hunger among them. The soldiers wanted to ask for help and shelter in the village, but were treated like villains and driven away. He believes the villagers deserve to die. Moe's is disgusted by the former soldier's approach. He talks about his two years of service to his country, South Korea, and how the army vows allegiance to the state and the people. Pronouncing aloud the words of the soldier's oath, Moe's deals the final blow, and finally kills the monster. Gyraton's bones crumble into dust, and Moe's walks away without even turning around. And this isn't because the heroes don't look at the explosions, but because he was simply embarrassed after shouting the soldier's oath out loud. The result of a quest for the hero is raising his level by 6, and receiving an achievement that raises all his stats by 2 points. A monster core also appears, which looks different from any he has seen so far. When Moe's touches the core, it flashes with a bright light, and a mass of various objects fall out of it. Delighted, Moe's immediately starts stuffing everything into his inventory. At the same moment, he notices the sword that Jeraton used in their clash. It's a sword called Sharma, and is one of 11 unique swords. Up to now, no one has yet succeeded in acquiring an item with a unique rank. It looks like Moe's is the first person to get lucky. While Moe's is bursting with pride over his reward, the item turns into a dark mist and penetrates the hero which causes him to gain a new skill, summoning the sword by saying its name. Moe's decides to test his new ability immediately. He says the sword's name aloud, a circle of summoning appears under his feet, and after a moment, the impressive Sharma sword itself materializes. While testing his new acquisition, Moe's comes upon something that immediately catches his attention. The item turns out to be a ring, also of the unique rank, Seal of the Corrupt Swordsman Jeraton. Moreover, it serves to activate a hidden quest. While collecting all the loot left after the fight with the skeleton commander, Moe's noticed that the day had already come. He had already spent a lot more time in this place than he thought. After packing everything up, he decided to return to the city. Players stationed in the city of Toiko were very surprised by the appearance of many new interesting items on the exchange, especially since they were all added by one player, a player already well known to everyone, a player nicknamed Moe's, who had already gained popularity during the troll raid. The Book of Fast Healing Skill attracts the most attention. While at the Central Trade Committee, Moe's learns that he has managed to earn more than 8,000 gold from the sale of items. It seems unreal to him how lucky he is to have managed to earn $800,000 while conquering a single dungeon, which by the way, he discovered completely by accident. Near the gold pile lie some coins, which turn out to be Ormishan tokens. One such token has a value of a thousand gold pieces, and as an item, has a magic rank, which is quite rare in the game world. Goblin, the committee worker, also warns Moe's to be careful, because everyone in the city is trying to identify him. They want to know who this famous mysterious Moe's is, and how he got so many interesting items for sale. The hero has to be extra careful because of the Dark Guild, which includes the worst players, thieves, kidnappers, and murderers. Moe's, strolling secretly through the city in the evening, notices that the situation really is serious. Practically every person he passes talks about him. The man realizes that a simple hood isn't enough to move around undetected, but quickly comes up with the right idea. To be able to hide better, he decides to invest in armor that will cover him all over. The armorer wonders if Moe's can even afford such armor because they are very expensive, but the man assures him not to worry because money isn't a problem for him. 
The specialist eventually pulls out a magnificent armor, and Mose realizes that by wearing it, he will easily remain anonymous. The armor costs 200 gold coins, but for Mose, such an expense is as much as nothing, and he quickly throws the appropriate amount on the counter taking the armor with him. An elven woman named Kia walks through the city at night. She is confronted by a man named Varen, and he offers his help in her mission. Kia refuses him, claiming that she doesn't need such an impatient companion, especially when her current mission could take up to several months. Veyron bites back by mocking her and calling her a lowly mutt, to which Kea responds with a swift attack. The elf wins the verbal skirmish and leaves by teleporting to Astani. After she leaves, Veyron pulls out a scroll with the mission's objective, and it turns out that the man is looking for the Star of Paluren, which belongs to Moes. Our hero is traveling with an elderly man, whom he accidentally defended from a monster attack, and the man in return offered him a ride. While on the road they talk about Moses' studies, the old man also tells the story of what made him start playing circuit. After being fired from his job, he opened a chicken restaurant, which also went bankrupt, so he decided to try working in transportation in the game. Accidentally, this transportation mission is very important, so if Moes hadn't intervened, the situation would have been very bad. Moe's plans to reach the Silver Village and only there decide on the further direction of his trip. The man offers to drive him to his next destination since he feels safer being able to count on help in defending himself against monsters. Upon reaching his destination, Moe's notices that his armor needs repair, so he decides to take care of that first. While waiting for his equipment, he wonders what special conditions might be required to activate the hidden quest, for which the ring acquired in the battle with Jiritan is responsible. Mose has been searching for clues since he acquired the ring, but so far, he has been unable to find out anything. Meanwhile, the armorer finished repairing the armor. Mose, heading to meet the carrier for his next destination, notices a crowd of people gathered around a man kicking another man lying on the ground. All the people standing around are perplexed, but no one wants to intervene. It turns out that the man being punished is the one Mose traveled with earlier. He is humiliated for being late in delivering a package, and the abuser is the heir to the village leader. The villagers are disgusted by this behavior, and the fact that the Order of Holy Knights doesn't react in any way. The hero steps in between the men, and stops the aggressor. The heir of the village clan is outraged that someone had the courage to oppose him. He believes that his status justifies his behavior. After a while, in a fit of anger, he also attacks Moes, but he makes an efficient dodge and pulls off a punch that slams the man into the wall, leaving him unconscious on the ground. Residents are shocked to see what has happened. No one believes that someone could raise a hand against the heir of the village chief, who, by the way, after a while appears personally on the scene. The village administrator, Morik, is upset about how his son was treated and orders his soldier to kill Mose. The knight approaches Mose, pulling out his sword and asking how he dared to strike the Lord. Without further ado, he attacks our hero. But in response, Mose summons his sword and easily defends himself from the soldier's attack. Mose deals a powerful blow while sending the knight straight into the recovering son of the village chief, and both lose consciousness lying on the ground. The village chief can't believe what he sees, and orders his knight to get up immediately, but to no avail. Mose turns his sword toward him, and announces that it's now his turn. The villagers watching the whole incident quickly recognize Mose as one of the holy knights. They are blown away by their enthusiasm over the fact that someone has finally stood up for them, and begin to complain about the fiscal problems the chef has been causing. Mose has no idea who the Holy Knights are, however looking at people's reactions, he decides not to admit the fact that he isn't one, and asks Morik if the accusations are true. The chef tries to explain himself by saying that the tax scams were to prepare for the possibility of a famine, but under pressure, he admits his wrongdoings. Mose decides to spare his life on the condition that he gives back the money to the residents that he had brazenly taken from them earlier. It turns out that the actions of the village chief were a hidden quest, and as a result of the whole situation, Moses' fame increases significantly. Another hidden task is also launched, a clue to a rare class, which directs Moes to a town on the border of the continent, Falupe. The hero's actions were watched from afar by two masked figures, who turn out to be real holy knights. One of them wants to punish Moes for impersonating them, but the other reminds him of the words of the prophecy, which said that thanks to the travelers, this world will become better. Besides, thanks to Moses' actions, they themselves have less to do, so he has done them a favor. They don't know who the man in the armor is, 
but they suspect it's the famous adventurer Mose. The two eventually decide to just observe the hero for the time being. After spending a few days in the city of Felupe, Mose doesn't know what to do next. He has failed to uncover any new clues. There is so little information about the hidden classes that the hero hasn't been able to find out anything even at the guild's information desk. This is not surprising at all, because the hidden classes are much stronger than the standard ones, and his quest involves unlocking one of them. Mose in the city notices elves for the first time, he didn't expect to see them in Felupe. Gazing at the figures, he is hit by a nervous running man, who turns around shouting for Mose to be careful how he walks. A moment later, there is an explosion that stops the rude guy, and another man appears in front of him accusing him of stealing. He catches Mose's attention, especially his ring, which he wears on one of his fingers. The thief pinned down throws himself at his opponent with a dagger but is killed by the mysterious man so quickly that Mose didn't even manage to register his movement. At this point, his hidden task is completed, and another rare class swordsman is launched. The new task instructs him to talk to the man. The mysterious man moves through the city streets sunk in darkness. Mose is secretly following him. Having the opportunity to take a better look at his ring, he noticed that it was the same as Jiritan's seal, which reminded him that the monster mentioned that he used to be a swordsman. The hero didn't think that the course of events would lead him in such a way. He feels like he is really lucky. While the hero was lost in his thoughts, the mysterious man disappeared from his field of vision and at the same moment appeared right behind him. The man quickly grabbed Mose by the neck while immobilizing him and after a while pulled him into a dark unlit alley. Only God knows what he is going to do to him. Mose is thrown against the ground and a sword blade flashes in front of his face. The man asks him who he is and why he is following him. After a moment, he turns his attention to his necklace and asks where he got it. He thinks that such an item is too precious for someone as pathetic as Mose. The hero answers without hesitation that he got it from item Gacha. But such an answer doesn't satisfy the man, who immediately attacks with his sword, bringing Mose's health level down below 5%. The man doesn't believe Mose, and because of that, the hero has to explain to him all the circumstances of getting the item. It seems that the swordsman knows the man who was responsible for the item Gacha. A smile appears on his face at the sound of the exact location. Taken aback, Mose asks who the man is, in the meantime recovering fully. It turns out that the mysterious man connected to the necklace is an exceptional class of criminal, Lyro the Gambler. Hearing this, Mose cannot believe that such an innocent old man was in fact a criminal. The swordsman's mission is to track down Lyro. That's because the criminal has information about one of the four great mysteries of Aspargan, the disappearance of the Langerous Cavalry. The incident occurred when the Langerous Cavalry, once called the continent's strongest troop, disappeared right after going to war. They later checked the place where they disappeared, but all they found there were ruins that appeared out of nowhere. What's most important in all this is that the necklace now in Moses' possession once belonged to Polorin, commander of the Langerous Cavalry. The hero knew it was a fantastic item, but he didn't realize it was that amazing. The swordsman, after seeing Moses' wounds heal, made sure the necklace was real. After a while, he pulls out his weapon, and with a smile on his lips, unexpectedly attacks the hero. Surprised Mose screams asking him what he's doing, but the swordsman's plan is clear. Since Polarun isn't here, all Mose has to do is die, and the necklace will go straight into his hands. With a smile on his lips, the man tells Mose to be a good boy and die quickly. The swordsman planned to kill Mose from the beginning, which is why he told him the story of the necklace so easily. In the end, the dead don't talk. Mose summons Sharma, but this time his opponent is much faster and stronger and delivers a blow that takes most of his life. Despite this, Mose quickly recovers and rises ready to continue fighting. The swordsman asks him if he is immortal, but Mose has no idea what that means. The man explains that they usually use the word user or player. That's what he meant by immortal. But it doesn't matter, because the swordsman simply plans to kill him endlessly, right after Mose returns to the living. Despite this, Mose doesn't lose his cool because he knows very well that only three seconds are enough for him to regain full health. But the mysterious swordsman has no intention of waiting at all. He deals a powerful blow that deprives Mose of almost all health points. He has only 3% left, and his consciousness slowly begins to fade. Suddenly, another stranger appears and blocks the swordsman's final blow. He accuses him of confessing secrets to an immortal and being blinded by greed. 
he declares him a traitor and issues a sentence on the spot, which is immediate execution. The swordsman unsuccessfully tries to explain himself and asks Master Robin for another chance, but it doesn't work, and after a while gets killed. Surprised Moe's cannot believe that the newcomer killed such a difficult opponent with such ease. To make matters worse, the man also plans to kill Moe's because he found out too much. The hero feels overwhelmed by an even more powerful opponent. He is able to sense the gap in their power levels without any problem. But Moe's has no intention of giving up at all. He has finally decided to change and give his all to experience many adventures in the game. Moe's rises from the ground, aware that even if he dies and receives the death penalty, he still has to fight with all his strength. The puzzled man asks Moe's why despite such a big difference between them, he still decided to fight. Moe's raises his sword claiming that in the current situation, he must do everything he can. Robin, surprised by such an attitude, says to himself that people with such a strong personality are extremely rare, even among swordsmen. At that exact moment, the stranger notices a sworder's seal on Moe's finger. He grabs the hero by the neck, lifts him up, and makes him explain where he got it. Moe's quickly replies that he obtained it after defeating Jiratan. Robin is unable to believe that someone so weak defeated Jiratan, but at the same time concludes that no lie can be seen in Moses' eyes. From the story told by Robin, we learn that Jiratan was a sworder several hundred years ago, but committed treason and joined the Imperial Army. In light of the new information, Master Robin gives Moe's two options. Either he will die painfully every time he is reborn, or he will take the place of the dead man and join the sworders. Moe's, of course, chooses the second option without hesitation. Robin takes such a quick decision by surprise. Admittedly, it isn't yet known whether Moe's is suitable for being the sworder, but it's a good start. After a while, Robin punches Moe's right in the face, and he loses consciousness. Moe's wakes up in a new location called Sanctuary. After some time, Moe's trains sword fighting in the training hall together with an elf, Kia. Despite his sincere intentions, Moe's is immediately forced to defend himself, and the girl asks with a smile on her lips if he really thought he could defeat her so easily. The elven girl's technique and speed are many levels above Moe's. No wonder, after all, Kia is Master Robin's first apprentice. Taking advantage of a moment of inattention, she deals Moe's the final blow sending him to the ground. After that, she says that he's not so bad after all, but he still has a lot of training ahead of him. Moe's promises himself that next time, he will be the one to win. After logging out of the game, Moe's talks to his mother, who refuses to accept money from him. She is suspicious of the fact that he has such an amount of money, but Moe's calms her down saying it's just savings, and quickly ends the conversation wondering what kind of hellish training awaits him in the game this time. A few days ago, after losing consciousness, Moe's woke up in a place called Sanctuary, which is the hideout of the mercenary organization, the Sorters. Members of this organization swear allegiance to the God of Blades. The Sorters are a small but elite group that undertakes international missions. Robin, who brought the hero to that place, is one of the Ten Masters. Moe's decided to treat this opportunity as his destiny and join the Sorters, but soon began to regret his decision when the downright hellish training began. It included not only fitness and strength preparation, but also a lot of boring theory. At one point, Moe's began to wonder if this difficult training was the reason why this organization is so small and so elite. The only reason the hero hasn't given up on swordsmanship and the game is Kia, who has accompanied him throughout his training period. Moe's is going on his first official mission as a newly appointed sworder. He bids farewell to Kia, who wishes him good luck on his first mission, and then sets off for Asparagon. As a reward for completing his training, Moe's has earned a unique ring, the Seal of the Sworder which increases damage in combat by 14%. The S-Class task assigned to the hero is to investigate the source of an unusual phenomenon in the northeastern point of Asparagon. It's the Northern Wall of Snow, and the client of the mission is the Order of Holy Knights. Walking around the city, Moe's notices that the number of players has increased. Eavesdropping on their conversations, he also notices that the average level of players has also increased. Suddenly, a cry for help comes to Moses' ears. A man appears in the crowd, saying that he has been robbed and can't get his equipment back until he brings the money. From the conversations of the people gathered around, it appears that this was most likely done by the Number One Guild, which consists only of players with magical equipment. 
This guild is known for taking control of public areas and kicking out those who are not members. Somewhere at a considerable distance from the city, a group of people wants to enter a cave, but the members of the number one guild don't allow them to do so, saying that only members are allowed to enter. A previously robbed man also appears near the cave. This time, however, Mose is with him and immediately confronts the bandits. Without even thinking about it, he calls them all disgusting trash. A fight immediately starts, and one of the bandits attacks Mose. However, the hero sends him to the ground without any problem. Surprised guild members all at once throw themselves at Mose. But despite the fact that he doesn't even draw his weapon, thanks to his strength and speed, he easily pacifies the entire group. Finally, their captain Suksa appears on the scene. Suksa is a so-called ranker. He holds a bronze rank, which only the top 9,000 players can enter. While Mose was training a lot has changed in the game. The most popular topic has become the ranking system. So far spots in ranking have been assigned according to popularity, but a certain informational guild has begun to create an official ranking. An angry Suksa threatens the others to leave the area because his guild is doing a mission here. He also tells Mose that he must pay for humiliating his guildmates. At these words, the hero punches the captain and summons his sword, saying that he intends to destroy their business. It takes him only a few seconds to defeat most of the bandits, and the others, seeing what happened to their colleagues, immediately flee. Mose, pleased with himself, leaves the area and heads for the airship he ordered earlier. On the ship, he meets a man who also turns out to be a member of the Sorters. Mose senses a powerful aura from him, and using his ability to check the stats of other players, discovers that the stranger has a 91st level. The swordsman's name is Kalwar, and he is from Lozvan. He mentions that something serious must have happened in the north due to the presence of five important people on the ship. Mose and his new companion decide to get acquainted with them. They soon find themselves in an expensive and bright room, where they find five people who are among the strongest on the continent. Aurora, Ivan, Seer, Hire, and Gon. With the last one possessing an incredible 244th level, Gon, who holds the highest level and the rank of a swordmaster, turns his attention to Mose, as he has heard that an immortal has managed to become a member of the organization. It is said that the title of swordmaster is the highest goal of all sworders. Mose and Calois respectfully introduce themselves to the master, who is pleased to see the young brave sworders. The meeting of the Gon turned out to be a hidden achievement, thanks to which Mose's strength has permanently increased by two points. Mose is very impressed by how strong people he was given the opportunity to meet are. Suddenly, the voice of the ship's captain comes out of the speakers, announcing the impending landing. Gon orders that they will discuss the details of the mission later, and everyone slowly begins to leave the ship. At the same moment, a pop-up window informs Mose that the task rank has just changed to SS. After the landing, everyone gathered and debates the new mission rank. If the rank of the task continues to rise, it's likely that Mose and Kalwar will be forced to abandon the mission, which may be the better option because otherwise, they will simply die. It turns out that the source of the supernatural phenomenon, and thus the object of the mission, has been discovered. Damage caused by red lightning has been observed in three different locations. It was originally thought that the weather changes were the result of a magical experiment, but it turns out that the cause is Garnus. It is a monster of the catastrophic class that came from an unknown continent. It is the named monster, the ancient dragon Garnus. The reward for completing the mission is 50 Ormachan coins from the Arantes Bank. Ivan is also to get permission to trade food in Asparagin, and Gon instead of a reward wants the others to agree to let two novice sorters, Mose, and his new companion, participate in the mission. The team stops at an inn, where they are hosted by Sire, a member of the Sincerity Caravan. While there, the Red Lightning has subsided, creating a good time to attack. Aurora volunteers to the front line to block the monster's attacks. Gon decides that he, along with the Sorters, will attack from behind. Others also report their positions. Seer will cast spells on everyone that will allow them to approach the dragon undetected. The mission finally begins. Soon the whole team heads to the mountains. There is such a big snowstorm all around that the road is barely visible. Suddenly, not far from Moe's, a lightning bolt created by the impact of the dragon's wings hits the ground, and its strength is astounding. Kalwar hurries Moe's, who was left behind. Everyone gathers and prepares to take off. 
Seer casts a spell that calms the surroundings. More spells are casted that give buffs to everyone. Mose feels an incredible energy surging through his body and is impressed by the skill of the others. Suddenly there is a sound in the distance belonging to an approaching dragon. Everyone assumes the predetermined positions, and after a while, a huge dragon Garnus appears right behind Moses' back. After appearing behind the hero, the dragon gathers energy and emits a powerful roar. Paralyzed Mose is unable to move, the dragon prepares to attack, and the man feels his end approaching. The dragon breathes fire directly at the hero. Fortunately, one of his companions protects him with his shield. Yvonne binds the monster's mouth with her whip, and then Gon and Hire attack the dragon right in its head. Admittedly, the dragon receives a small amount of damage, but attacks of this type are certainly not able to threaten it. Garnus breaks free of the whip's grip, and the team immediately prepares to counterattack. Aurora uses his special ability and deflects the flame previously gathered in the shield straight at the monster. However, the dragon doesn't stay idle and also breathes fire. The priest casts spells to support the team members and weaken the enemy. Thanks to that the shield attack finally reaches its target. Unfortunately, even this attack doesn't inflict much damage on Garnus, and Mose is impressed by the effect of the spells that raise the level of his companion. He recalls that a similar situation occurred during the fight with Jiratan. Garnus takes to the air with the intention of attacking from above. Yvonne tries to stop him using her White Rose Vine skill, but even with the increased level, she feels she won't be able to hold the monster for long. The monk rises into the air to cast a spell, and Mose, along with Kalwar, moves to attack the dragon while it's grounded. However, Garnas notices them, and easily pushes the heroes away. Mose is frustrated by how hard it is for him to attack. Gon approaches the Sorters and gives them tips on how they should improve their attacks. But he also says that the essence and duty of a Sorter is to develop his own technique, and this is something they must achieve on their own. Along with these words, he performs a special attack aimed straight at the dragon. This time it's an attack that significantly injures Garnus, and the monster falls on its back with a cry of pain. Gon with the raised level greatly surpasses the strength of the monster which puts Mose in great awe. He feels as if he is watching his role model as a sorter. The master orders them to attack to take advantage of the dragon's weakness, and Mose is determined to make at least some mark in the battle. Mose emits power and focus, which Gon takes notice of, noting in his mind that someone with great potential has joined the organization. Mose raises his sword and deals a blow to the dragon. Unfortunately, the blow has virtually no effect. The master tells Mose not to overload himself because he still lacks experience. And after a while, he deals a blow that seriously injures Garnus. The dragon writhing in pain falls to the ground again. The young sorter can't stop admiring how strong the master sorter is. At the same moment, higher from the air, orders everyone to move away from the dragon. A golden blade appears in the sky. Hire asks for forgiveness, but the dragon must die because many other lives depend on it. Aurora quickly rallies everyone to hide behind his shield. After a while, a golden ray strikes the dragon, a huge explosion occurs, and the monster itself eventually dies with a shrill scream. Mose rejoices in his victory, and not far away notices the core that fell out of the boss, and wonders if he is the only one who sees it since the rest are not players. The battle with Garnus is finally over. During this mission, Mose managed to level up as many as 25 times. Aurora left as soon as he got his reward. Yvonne summoned her men to dismember the dragon's body, and left when she had enough valuable loot. Hire thanks the swordsman once again, and in turn, Gon says that just meeting Kalwar and Mose, young and skilled sworders, is a reward in itself. The hero is embarrassed by this, especially since he had the impression that Hire has high hopes for him, for some reason. In the end, Gon is left alone with the young sworders. He addresses them by their titles, and they kneel before him. He solemnly bids them farewell, saying that when their swords reach the world he lives in, he will welcome them with open arms. And after these words, he says goodbye, and departs through the portal. Kalwar also says goodbye to Mose, saying that he has some urgent business to take care of. When the hero is left alone, he decides to take care of the core left behind by the dragon. Although he feels that he did nothing in the battle, it's a pity for him to leave such a prize especially since he is anxious to become much stronger. Mose places his hands on the core, and it emanates a bright light showing the rewards. An impressive looking armor and a sword fall out of the core. The weapon turns out to be the Atoria's Stigma, and the armor the set of Atoria's Rising Sun, both of unprecedented legendary quality. 
Mose is extremely shocked after seeing the quality of the items, which are as amazing as Garnus was. Thus, our protagonist officially became the first person in the game to obtain legendary items. During the Circuit TV stream, there is a talk about the information that came out yesterday from the Information Guild. There will be a battle of rankers on all continents. So far, rankings have only been awarded based on registered users, but there are plans to make the measurements much more accurate in the future. Special missions at the international level will be awarded to rankers in Asparagan Square. After Mose decided to become stronger in the game, he started running every day to improve his condition. When he recently returned to reality after a long time in-game, his head was spinning and he couldn't adjust back to the different environment. The man feels like the game is the real thing, not the other way around. His in-game character allows him to make much more money than he could earn in real life. He wonders if he should take the game less seriously and live a normal life like the people around him, but quickly realizes that if it weren't for the game, he wouldn't be able to afford a carefree life through lack of money. Mose puts an end to unnecessary thoughts and decides to return to the game where he feels he belongs. Mose runs his errands in town before returning to Sanctuary. He checks his equipment and also takes out his new legendary sword. However, when he holds it for a long moment something strange begins to happen. The hero feels pain, and then there is a flare of energy. Mose feels overwhelmed by the energy that now flows through him. He is given a passive sword skill, which makes him automatically learn Atoria's special fighting techniques. At the same moment, the hero senses someone's presence around the corner. He checks it, but it turns out to be just another player who communicated with someone using a crystal ball. This is an item that allows you to talk to someone at a distance. Mose remembers his friends from the troll raid and decides to invest in the orb himself. After settling all his affairs, he moves to Sanctuary. The hero finds himself at the airport, where he is greeted by a female employee, whom he informs of his destination, the Bing Caravan. Mose is guided by the woman to the ship. The hero, after he arrived at the Sanctuary, was given a message from his master Robin, telling him where to go next. Kea is waiting for him on board, which pleases Mose immensely. They have been assigned to a joint mission. After landing in Bing Caravan, Mose is tired from the long journey. Kea shows him a skyscraper in which all sorts of things are traded. The hero is impressed by the huge building. A member of the Information Guild, Russell, comes out to greet the two. Soon, all three ascend the skyscraper's elevator to the swordsman's accommodation. Kia asks if Russell is the person sent by the master to which the man replies that he will give them all the details when they get inside. After closing the door, the man informs them that the words he speaks have the same weight as those of Master Robin. The Sworders immediately pay their respects to him, and Russell begins to read the contents of the mission. The order had to be given this way due to the fact that they both got this mission at the same time. A weapon that shouldn't exist and should never be given to anyone, has been smuggled into Bing Caravan. It is an amazing item. It's a magical music sheet composed by the Mad Musician. It is said that this item will soon be displayed in an auction house on the top floor of a skyscraper. This city is ruled by merchants, so no one has the right to forcibly steal items taken to the caravan. That's why the goal of the mission is to successfully auction the item regardless of the cost. Kea will impersonate an aristocrat, Lady Ariane, and Mose will impersonate her escort knight named Maxim. The evening of the social gathering arrives. The hall is full of glamour and rich-looking people. Lady Ariane of the House of Perif is announced. She draws the attention of all those gathered with her dazzling appearance. In order to carry out the mission successfully, the two must blend in as well as possible. They are greeted by Akazit von Ram from the Akazit family who offers them a seat. Kea politely accepts the offer and follows the woman. Everyone around seems to be amused by something, which Mose notices. The woman with an ominous expression on her face welcomes them to the Ariak family, and the other women laugh at her pronunciation. Mose reacts to this joke with irritation, but Kia remains unmoved. Akazid apologizes, and explains that she thought it would be more polite to use the Perif dialect. A conversation about Perif-run wineries ensues, and as it turns out, the Aryan family also runs one. The women deride this and consider themselves better aristocrats because of their background. They also bring up the fact of Aryan's half-elf race and that elves are mere slaves. The necklace that Kia wears is also laughed at. It's reversed which implies her lack of elegance. Akazit orders his servant to correct the jewelry, 
But when he reaches for the woman's neck, Moe stops him while twisting his arm and asking if he wants to say goodbye to his life. The aristocrats gathered at the table are shocked at this sight. Kia mocks the behavior of the aristocracy with superiority and compares the knight's level to trash. Despite the insults in her direction, she wants to settle the matter as it should be, through an honorable duel with their honor at stake. At these words, Mose quickly draws his sword and stands ready to fight. The news of the duel spreads to all people present. Orf, a knight of the Akazit family, also stands up to fight. Mose takes notice of his low level, and after a moment effortlessly and easily avoids his attack. He then returns the blow, and the enemy knight falls to the ground. The assembled people are quite impressed, and Lady Akazit in annoyance calls her second knight, Longshell, to deal with the problem. The knight moves gracefully and quickly attacks, but Mose parries all attacks without the slightest problem. Soon after, Longshell is also defeated and falls powerless to the ground. After the duel is over, Kia comes to the front and expresses her disappointment with the social gatherings held here. She speaks with dissatisfaction about the disrespect and prejudice of the aristocracy and hopes that this will change in the future. She emphasizes the fact that people of all cultures come together at Bing Karawan. This makes a positive impression on the attendees, who begin to clap. In the crowd, there is a hooded figure who is watching the whole incident from afar. With a sinister smile on his face, he says to himself that he has been waiting for this moment all this time. For the moment when he will meet Mose again. The swordsmen relax in their suite and talk about the mission. Mose looks admiringly at her companion, impressed by her earlier acting. The woman tells him that she really experienced such a situation. She was once a slave to an aristocrat, which shocks Mose. It was through this that she learned how the upper class thinks. Kia admits that she previously felt like killing those who mocked her background, but now she is a sorter and leads a new life. Mose is sorry for his friend's story, but she doesn't seem to care and comforts the hero. She changes the subject and talks about the fact that both of them are supposed to get a longer break after doing this mission, so they should finish it quickly. The swordsmen talk about the details of the auction, its financial issue, and the fact that they will have to discover what organization wants to purchase the object of their mission. In order to successfully discover who the organization is, they will have to raise the price as high as they can. After a while, the heroes enter the Eden auction house. The auctioneer welcomes all the attendees by announcing objects more valuable than gold. He tells about secret relics and delightful treasures. Soon, the auction begins. The first auction item turns out to be a nail from the index finger of the last princess of the fallen country, Ezrindel, to which Mose and Kia react with relief. From the displayed message about the item, Mose learns that even just possessing it activates a hidden quest. The starting price of the item is three tokens, and the participants in the exchange quickly begin to raise it. The final price becomes 17 tokens, and the item is sold. Mose is tired of the atmosphere in the hall, to which Kia tells him to pull himself together. After all, they haven't even really started yet. The second item is announced, and it is Rhapsody No. 7, a piece by the best and also worst brilliant musician known as the Mad Musician. The pop-up window associated with the item is black, making it different from anything Mose has seen so far. It appears to be no ordinary item. The asking price is four tokens, and this time it also begins to rise at a fast pace. When the price reaches nine tokens, Kia raises it to 25 without hesitation. However, at the last minute, someone gives 50 tokens. Everyone is shocked, and Mose tries to look around the room to find who is crazy enough, but his friend tells him not to move and raises the price to 75 tokens. Mose points out that she has gone over budget, but the elf is more concerned with her rival's reaction. Suddenly an offer of 100 tokens comes from the stranger. The swordsmen are pleased with the result of their trick. When Mose gets up to grab the person who won the bidding, he suddenly freezes in place. Standing before him is the man responsible for the item gotcha game in which he won the necklace, a wanted criminal, the gambler Lero. The man flees, but the swordsmen catch up with him and stop his escape. Lero is impressed that Mose was looking for him so diligently. He says he expected the hero to come to him and releases a terrifying magical aura. Mose directs his words to his friend and tells her to be careful. Because the elf is not a player, she is unaware of how strong their opponent is. The criminal is a terrifying monster. Kia asks her friend if he knows the man, 
to which he replies that he once bought something from him in Linderoak. However, it seems very strange to him that the suspicious man still remembers him. Lyro suddenly approaches Moe saying that of course he remembers such an amazing encounter. The hero is terrified by the speed of the man, and before he could even react, Kia throws herself between them. She says she doesn't understand the situation, but she can't stand idly by, and as a swordsman, she will discover his secret. She throws herself into the attack. Lyro, however, easily makes a dodge and completely ignores the girl. He approaches Moe's again, says he needs to talk to him, and with a snap of his fingers casts a spell. The spell cast by Lyro made them invisible. Lyro wants to talk to Moe's in private. He says the immortal surprised him, and his insane nature comes out. He starts laughing fanatically. Moe's is horrified, and the criminal begins to tell the story that before Moe's, he selected a thousand immortals, but none of them used the items he handed them as they should have. Usually they just sold them without a second thought. Because of Moses' uniqueness, Lyro had to change his plans solely for him. He admits that all the things that have happened to Moe so far and allowed him to get this far were his doing and part of his plan. The protagonist is in shock, unable to believe that all this wasn't just plain luck. Stunned, Moe falls to the ground and asks why. The criminal replies that it's because he wants this world to be conquered by immortals. He tells the hero to give in to his anger and use his power to destroy the empire. Lyro wants Moe's to take revenge on the disgusting imperialists for his family, the imperialists who took everything from him. Moe's reacts to the words about revenge, and Lyro continues to try to convince him into action. Moe's thinks about the elf, and whether their meeting was also just part of Lyro's plan, but quickly comes to the conclusion that he decides his own path. He tells Lyro about this, about how he decided to become a sorter by himself, and endured the pain of training. Nonetheless, he thanks him for offering him the necklace that saved him, and that is why he decides that now is his time to help the man change. Lyro is shocked. A new task to defeat Lyro is activated. Moe's moves to attack, and after wounding the man, a sinister black aura begins to emerge from Lyro. It is Lyro's grief, which is actually his power. The criminal says that he can offer such power to Moe's as well if he only wants it. He gives him one last chance and tells him to make a choice. Moe's firmly refuses Lero's proposal. It enrages him terribly. He can't understand this decision since with this power he could have everything he wants. He could have the whole world. The swordsman however is not the least bit interested in such things. The criminal decides that in that case, Moe's has to die. Moe's realizes that he is in a difficult situation and that the fight will not be easy at all. Both men parry each other's attacks. Lyro talks about how he realizes that there are people who see things differently from them, and enjoy things they can't. He knows that there is another world from which Moe's comes, and he has come to know it at the price of selling his body and soul. Moe's opponent uses increasingly aggressive attacks, saying that he knows that players come to this world looking for entertainment, so he will provide it for him. Physical as well as verbal attacks are coming from all sides, but Moe's doesn't bow to them. Lyro doesn't understand why the player doesn't want to accept his proposal since he only came here to have fun and shouldn't care what happens to this world. Moe's agrees with him, and says that he only came to this world to make money, and he became strong and gained a ton of experience just because of Lyro. However, during his travels, he discovered that this world is very beautiful. All the places he was given to visit made his heart beat faster. He expresses his gratitude to Lyro, and his understanding of his situation, which makes the man hopeful but Moe's once again refuses to destroy this world. In his opinion, despite having learned all this, it seems to him that Lyro doesn't really want the annihilation of the Empire. Moe's says that he intends to take his pain and carry his burden which makes Lyro laugh. He thinks that Moe's has no right to tell him what he really wants. The criminal decides to kill the swordsman right away, since he even has no intention of listening. Lyro's attacks are very effective, and Moe's quickly loses his health. The opponent is determined to show his desire for revenge, and the hero's health begins to drop dangerously low. Moe's realizes that in this situation, he will never reach Lero with words. But if he doesn't stop him now, Lero will always stay in the circle of revenge. As he tries to figure out what to do, his sword begins to emanate a bright light. The stigma of Atoria effect for killing a hundred monsters is activated, and a new skill, Disastrous Flame Solar Storm, is unlocked. Moses' body begins to move on its own, 
and as he stabs his sword into the ground, flames spread all around, enveloping his opponent, enclosing him in a huge vortex of fire. Lario recalls his wife and children who were murdered, his revenge, where he killed a man in front of an innocent child, and his remorse, which he tried to silence by blaming the Empire. Lyro eventually admits his mistake and just before dying, he finally thanks Mose for stopping him, and for his salvation. He says goodbye, and his body crumbles into fine dust. Closing his eyes, Mose also thanks him for the chance he got from him. The veil spell disappears, and a worried Kia runs up to a crying Mose. The hero acquires the new trait, the Lucky Ruiner. After returning from the mission, Mose looks over his new acquisition. His new title gave him two new skills, the Lucky Ruin, which allows him to turn items into cores, and the Ruiner Mix, which allows him to combine and store cores. Lyro was able to distribute the items probably because of this skill. It's a legacy he passed on to Moe's, so it's now up to him to make sure the criminal story never repeats itself again. Through getting to know Lyro, Moe's has learned that even NPCs in the game have feelings and are also human. They are different from characters who only speak back the way they were programmed. So calling Circuit just a game may be wrong. Perhaps it would be better to look at it as a whole new world. The protagonist is approached by Kia asking if everything is okay, and what he plans to do during his vacation. Mose has no plans. The elf plans to visit her hometown, a small village in Azarus. Mose says he would love to visit it in the future, and his friend answers him with a smile that he can do it whenever he wants. Sometime later, Mose, who is not feeling too well, walks around the capital, Asparagan. He decides to take a break before his next mission, and that's when his magic orb starts ringing. When he picks it up, it turns out that Sharan is calling him. The former team meets together in a tavern. Mose is flooded with questions about what happened to him the whole time they didn't see each other. He says he doesn't know where to start because of how much has happened. In this case, the youngest member comes forward to tell the story first, and proudly informs that he has acquired a magic item, set of rings, which he uses with his girlfriend. Everyone rejoices and congratulates him sincerely. Sharon says that the girl is an elf, and Mose is shocked because it's the first time he's heard of a player's relationship with a game character. Although Mose has already understood that game characters are no different from real people. In this game, people make their dreams come true. But even then, he was still surprised by Guile's words. This must mean that he still doesn't fully understand this concept yet. Guile turns to Mose and asks if he could address him informally, and thanks him for making him rich during the troll raid, and paying for his studies. He was also able to start earning a lot more thanks to him. Moe says that's not true because if the boy wasn't on the team, he would be in a much more dangerous situation himself. Sharon says that Moe's is the reason why the team gathers sometimes, because if it weren't for him, everyone would then be victimized by the guild leader of Silver. Rumors have spread about players who fell into this trap and had to quit the game. They also say that if it wasn't for Moe's, they wouldn't have been able to defeat the terrifyingly strong boss at the time. At this point, Mose thinks with gratitude about Lyro, who gave him a chance. And because of that, he now can give opportunities to others. Sharon boasts about the fact that she quit her job because she wanted to focus more on the game. She also brags about her new rare rank weapon. Mose is impressed, especially since he knows how hard it is to get such items. Mose admires his friend's efforts. Comparing himself to them, Mose thinks that from acquiring the Star of Polar Run until now with a tremendous amount of luck, he has acquired companions, high-ranking items, and skills much easier than others. He hoped that his luck will stay with him even in the future. Mose reminds himself that he promised to put effort into everything as long as he had the chance. He promised himself that he would enjoy the game, just like his friends. He decides that he needs to focus more on where he started. He proposes a joint mission to his friends, but at that time, he still didn't know what they would soon experience. After some time, the terrified team finds themselves in the cave and is surrounded by a group of monsters near a cliff. Their task is to remove the harmful monster colonies in the mines of DeMont Hill. To understand what happened, we have to go back in time. The team travels by coach through the mountains and discusses the task, which is to destroy the colony of Kamuds, whose further spread could threaten to collapse the mines. Mose asks if anyone knows anything about these monsters. Guile found information in the book that it's a species belonging to the family of deep mountain monsters, and lives in herds of about a dozen. The task is to destroy the entire colony, and the task is marked with the rank of a wyvern, 
which means there could be even more than 500, which of course stresses Guile out. Mo states that in that case there must be someone leading them, so they should focus on killing the leader. The tank agrees with him, pointing out that the leader is usually in the rear watching the battle, so to reach him, they need to occupy favorable terrain in advance. The team divides their tasks, Sharon will go to the high ground and learn the topography of the area. Guile will assist Moe's with magic, while the tanks will focus on defense. Moe's is surprised that everything is focused around him. Sharon explains that this is because he is the main factor in their mission, and Guile stresses that this is the only way their plan can succeed. Moe's, seeing the hopeful and trusting gazes of his friends, firmly announces that he is ready and understands the plan. The team is walking along paths in the cave heading down, when suddenly Sharon stops them, because she heard strange sounds. When they reach that point, it turns out that the path ends and they are on a cliff. Guile clings to the wall and warns the others about falling, when suddenly a monster appears right behind him. The archer shouts to warn him, and Moe's jumps in and blocks the monster's attack. The tank checks to see if the mage is okay, and then when even more monsters appear. A new task information window also appears about the need to kill 1,500 enemies and one unknown monster. Guile is frightened by this amount, and Sharon tells him to get a grip and return to his position. He is attacked by monsters not allowing him to pass, but he is helped by a shield man blocking the enemies. The monsters are too many, and the player's difficult position prevents them from acting as planned. Guile turns his attention to Sharon, who has been isolated from them, making it very difficult for them to help her. Moe's calls out to her to head in their direction, and he himself also begins to clear the passage. With this, Sharon finally manages to join the rest of the team. There are so many monsters that it will be hard to fight them off one by one. The archer tells Guile to pick up the pace, but the man is simply too scared. The plan has failed, however. The team can't give up like this, and they have to try something. Especially since they have to at least discover who the mysterious leader might be. Moe's wonders what he can do. And that's when his best skill, Atoria's Stigma kicks in, while activating a catastrophic flame, the Solar Storm skill. The tank says he'll shield them, but is interrupted by the swordsman saying he'll take care of it. The monsters throw themselves at Moe's, crushing him. The tank is terrified that something has happened to him. But then, there is an explosion so powerful that he has to hide from it behind his shield. He is shocked when Moe's emerges from the remains of the monsters, the hero has killed more than 400 monsters in one go. The fight goes on. Moses' flames spread all around, and the number of defeated monsters quickly increases. The others are greatly impressed by their friend's strength. Sharon was aware of his strength, but she didn't think Mose was that powerful. Mose defeats more than half of the monsters and checks to see if the others are okay. Now they all attack together and successfully stop the enemies. The hero recalls the old days and really enjoys the fight. Suddenly, a task message appears informing them that they have reached the final boss. Sharon tells them to look in the middle of the horde. There they find a person sitting among the monsters. A mysterious stranger approaches them and speaks up pleased to see another person. Mose asks the stranger who he is, and the man, even more pleased, calls himself a fell person. Mose can't understand what this is supposed to mean. The man explains to him that it is because of the hump on his back. It was because of it that his mother, when he was still a child, threw him off a cliff. Everyone is shocked by the story. Mose asks if there are more people like him. The man says there are, but after a moment adds that everyone else has already become bones. The man points out that the group looks like his parents, and asks whom they intend to abandon. Angry Guile says they aren't here for that, but the boy doesn't believe them, and is offended by the fact that they killed his friends. The monsters took care of him when he was abandoned and he taught them how to live together. For this, they are to fulfill his wish, which is to get rid of the hole leading to the cave. The team tries to explain to him that he can't do it because the whole village will die because of it. However, the man says that it doesn't matter because, by the king's order, the dead disabled outnumber the people living in the village. It turns out that the ruler of the village blackmails the parents of children with defects and orders them to get rid of them under threat of death. The heroes are shocked to hear about such a sick situation. They can't understand the fact that parents can be ordered to abandon their own children just to make the village look better. They are filled with rage, and now understand why people in the village looked strange. The stranger threatens that if they disturb him, he will get very angry. The team, no matter how high the reward, 
isn't happy with the way things are. Mose realizes that a mission in which they have to choose what will be better is a new experience for his friends. The team discusses what they should do. They decide to try to convince the boy. Mose approaches him and apologizes for killing his friends. He explains that despite that he can't destroy the village because by doing so, his mother might die too. He promises that they will talk to the evil lord and see to it that no child is ever dropped again. These words please the orphan child, who doesn't want anyone to get hurt. Mose also says that in return he must leave the place with his friends, so that he can help other orphan children. The boy agrees if Mose makes him a promise, which he does without hesitation. The swordsman stands up, and announces that he would like to make a proposal. After some time, Mose is sitting in the tavern near the castle de Mont, and talks through a crystal ball. He says he has a mission he would like to entrust to the person he is talking to. The client is to be named Maxime. At the same time, in the cave, the man checks how the team has accomplished its task. Since there is no trace of any monster, and the task was correctly completed, the team gets an additional 6,000 gold. The friends now decide to go to Demont Castle. Guile wonders if Moe's, who isn't with them now, is also doing well. Two hours earlier, the team had agreed that they wanted both revenge on the village ruler, and a reward. Moe's suggested a way out of the situation, using the freedom of gameplay that Circuit provides. That way, anything they can imagine can happen within the confines of the game's rules. Since the goal of the task was to get rid of the monsters, then their voluntary departure from the mine also counts. In that case, if everything goes according to the swordsman's plan, then they will succeed in achieving both goals. Two masked figures enter the village, and rumors spread among the residents. One of the arrivals calls for the lord of the village and says that she has come here to investigate his evil doings. This situation is looked at by a satisfied Mose, and the masked figure turns out to be Kia. The confident lord of the village appears, clearly surprised by the visit of the noble guests. The man drops to the ground in front of the second hooded figure asking to be heard. He speaks of his daughter possessing the most beautiful eyes he has ever seen. However, because of his unwillingness to abandon her because of her disability, he was threatened with death. The man judges that in that case he doesn't need to look for evidence anymore and shows his face. The man turns out to be a member of the Order of Holy Knights higher. The Lord of the Village says that there is no one more dedicated to the homeland than he is, and that it's the good soldiers who make a good country, while those cursed from birth have no place here. The official's words arouse bitterness. The Lord explains his actions driven by this philosophy, and says that the rules of the territory cannot be ignored unless the Emperor himself decides so. However, the Knight points out one problem, and that is, he didn't come here to stop how he treats people. He came here having heard a rumor about a mission reported by the Information Guild, and the purpose of this mission is to take revenge on a particular lord. The official is outraged by the fact that someone would dare to want to hurt him, and orders everyone to be arrested. Hyer asks Larry how he dares to do this in front of him, in front of the knight that serves the Saintus. According to the law established by the Saintus, everything he said testifies against him. He says that people like him are only poisoning the continent. The Lord of the Castle continues to try to defend himself, which enrages the knight even more. But he immediately calms down, saying that since this is not his mission, he won't interfere. Shocked, Larry feels that something strange is happening around him, and before he has time to react in any way, Kia decapitates him. The residents are shocked and immediately start celebrating the fact that they are finally free. At this point the task is completed, as the last boss of the mission was in fact the Lord of Demont Castle. The friends rejoice at the completed mission, and the fact that Mose was right. Sharon shows the hero a letter to him from an abandoned child, which she found in the mine. The letter is clumsily written, and has pictures. The sender thanks him, and writes that they left the mines as promised. He also asks Mose to go down once more, and check out the large ship that is there. His reading of the letter is interrupted by Kea. She reproaches him for how long a journey she had to make to get to this place. While the girl complains, Moses is happy to see his friend. He was already missing her, which confuses her slightly. They all hang out together in the tavern and talk. Sharon asks Kia what kind of relationship she has with Moe's, to which she replies that they are co-workers, which makes the man, who thought he would be considered someone more special, uncomfortable. He remembers the underground of the mine, which he must visit before he leaves. Walking through the cave, 
he notices that it's much cleaner, and wonders if it's due to completing the mission. When he reaches the place from the letter, a huge ship emerges from under the water. A message appears in front of Moe saying that he can use his skill and turn the ship of the ruler of heaven into a core. Moe does so without a second thought. A blinding flash appears, and then a blue core appears in the hero's hands. The item has a legendary rank. While leaving the cave, Moe gets surprised by someone. It turns out to be Hire, who is impressed saying that this is the first time he has met the same immortal so often. Moe says that he didn't expect the knight to show up either, to which the man replies that the Order has been watching the village for some time. Moe asks if the man intends to punish Kia for what she did, since according to the Order's fundamental principles, it is a sin. Hire agrees with him, but emphasizes the fact that he is also a human. The hero doesn't understand since Hire is just a game character, but the knight explains that he has a great hatred for those who control people through fear and terror. So he wanted to show gratitude to Moe's. Hire leaves, and the swordsman reflects on his words. Kea, after yesterday's meeting, doesn't feel very well due to having drunk too much, but she is happy that she was able to make new friends. Moe's is also happy that his friends got along. Kia tells the protagonist that she likes the players because the players don't have biases in the game and don't judge her based on her race. She says she values and likes Moe's for just that, and her words move the hero. The swordsmen go down for a meal. The friends ask Moe's what he plans to do now. He replies that he plans to look for another assignment, and asks if the others would like to join him. The team eagerly agrees, and is immediately ready for more adventures. Kia approaches Moe's and asks where he plans to go this time. The hero says he has no specific destination to which Kia seems saddened. Moe's suggests that she go with them which immediately improves her mood. Kia agrees very quickly. The group of friends travels by ship, which Moe's found in a cave. Everyone is impressed by the transport, and wonders where the swordsman got it from. Kia draws attention to an elf spirit on the ship. The hero says that this is Elsha, who is the core and base of this ship, and the fairy of the tree. Elsha greets them, and informs them that the heroes will soon reach Asparagan. After landing, Kia jokes about whether Moe's is secretly a White Tower wizard or something like this. Moe's tells everyone to go to the Information Guild, where he notices a large crowd of people. Moe's pushes through the players and learns that all guild services on all continents are suspended. Everyone is shocked when suddenly a person in the crowd calls everyone into the square. On the screen displayed, dead bodies can be seen which causes confusion among those gathered. A figure appears on the screen, and says that they have effectively taken control, and the players won't be able to interrupt the transmission. He addresses the immortals having resented their intrusion into their world, because no one allowed them to do so. He furiously lists his grievances with the players and says they have no intention of just watching them conquer their world. He shows the execution of defenseless people which moves Moe's considerably. The figure finally introduces himself as Lydorn, Prince of Logis, and declares war against the immortals, meaning all the players. This event activates a joint S rank task on a very large scale. After yesterday's events, there was panic on the circuit websites. Many players considered it a mere event, but also many expressed their concern. A lot of people also sympathized with Lydorn. Players began to quickly seek partners for the mission, with nearly 1 million players coming together to defeat Lydorn. Moe's is traveling on his ship. He is gazing out the window when Kia brings him tea. The hero asks his friend what she thinks about recent events. Kia answers him that such a turn of events surprised her, but she didn't feel anything special, most likely due to the fact that she has always participated in the war. In order not to be abandoned by her parents, she became a victim so that she could survive as a slave, in order not to lose to the people who cursed her blood. She was so focused on keeping herself safe that she didn't focus on other wars. Moe's is once again sorry for what happened to her friend, and immediately apologizes to her. Kea, however, doesn't care at all. She says that according to wizards, this world is in an unstable state, with many dimensions constantly opening and closing. Every race other than humans originates precisely from these open passages, including the elves. Moe's is surprised by the new information. In the beginning, there were many wars, but now all races have come to an agreement. However, discrimination against other races continues to exist, and now immortals have also appeared. The players cause a bit of trouble because of their nature. However, 
It's thanks to them that civilization has progressed even further. Mose asks her friend what she thinks about the players. Kia reminds him that, as she said earlier, she likes them because they look at her through the prism of what kind of person she is, not her race. She says that Mose is a great example of such a player. The hero at these words gets embarrassed and thanks her. The elf wonders what it might be like if all players were like Mose and his friends. Mose thinks it's due to the fact that many players don't understand the game characters. The likes of Lydorn exist, and he certainly has his reasons too. The hero looks with sorrow at those who have gone through a lot, but he doesn't support the tyrant's methods. He believes that it's impossible to solve problems this way. Therefore he decides that he must quickly stop Lidorn. On the battlefield it's raining, and the ground is full of the bodies of defeated warriors. One man who is badly wounded is shocked at how the entire legion of players was instantly defeated. He is horrified. He finds it impossible to defeat the Black Griffin cavalry. The news reports that in a major new event, the first guild to take part was totally smashed. To make matters worse, right after winning the battle, Prince Lidorn led his cavalry even further. Mose is watching the news through the crystal ball along with Kia. They say that the situation is getting more difficult, and they need to move to help. The team ponders together on what to do. The hero's friends decide to follow him to the end, which really shocks him. The team talks about how they realize that they are much weaker than Moe's, but they will not abandon him as long as he leads them. They decide that their team should have a leader, and that leader should be Moe's. The swordsman tries to contradict them, but seeing the approval from Kea, he finally agrees. He takes responsibility, and asks for his friend's trust. The team is happy having Moe's as their leader. Kea also vows her devotion. The hero thanks and promises to always stand in the front line. The situation on the battlefield is tough. The players are slowly losing hope. Then they get information from another front, where the situation is also critical. The soldiers are unable to continue fighting. The players decide to join together, and then the enemy cavalry arrives again. The surprised players start to run away, and one of them decides to buy the rest some time. He is immediately attacked, which knocks him off balance. At the same moment, a spell is cast, which repels the enemy. The person who saved the player tells him to go back to the others. The mysterious man turns out to be the first player to get to the White Tower. A wizard with third place in the official ranking. A player named Kellyon. In the tents of the players, there are discussions about the war. The leader is annoyed that all his allied parties were defeated by such a small unit. Kellyon says that this is no ordinary unit, and it's a miracle that so many players survived. One player gets angry at these words, and accuses the mage of not helping. Another player stands up for Kellyon, but the argument is interrupted by a sudden noise. Lidorn's troops at this point, are heading for the player's headquarters. The soldiers rush to their positions led and hurried by one of the players. Kellyon stands and watches the advancing enemy forces, wondering if it is even possible to defeat them. Lidorn turns to his men, apologizes for forsaking his country and honor, and expresses gratitude that despite this, they chose to follow him. He says that not even a goddess could get in the way of their loyalty. He mentions his beloved, to whom he entrusted his soul. Beloved who died at the hands of the immortals. At the end of his speech, he shouts the creed of the Black Griffins, and orders his soldiers to spread their wings, at which they move to attack. The troops on Griffins easily deal with their opponents. Kellyon does what he can to help however his mana is quickly reaching its limit. The man fears that this time they will suffer a total defeat, and wonders what to do. The mage suddenly gets a notification that Elsha asks for his mana. He is surprised at how powerful she must be since she needs so much, but decides not to think about it and just gives her what he has left. At the same moment, Moses' ship appears in the sky, and all the players are surprised. The machine opens its cannons, and Elsha prepares to fire. She attacks and successfully wounds the enemy. All the players are increasingly surprised. They have no idea who is helping them. Someone shouts that they should not delay and take advantage of the situation by attacking the distracted enemy. From the ship, the situation is watched by Moe's with his team, while they prepare to go down to join the player's army. They enter the middle of the battle, and immediately attack. Blows are exchanged. Moe's, while helping others, also gets attacked, and in turn, he is helped by Kellyon. The mage thanked them for their help, thanks to which they avoided a critical situation. Kellyon says that he didn't even dream that there was a player with such a huge ship, and helps Moe's to stand up. They are interrupted by Kia, who says this isn't the time for greetings. 
The swordsman agrees with her, saying he would be happy to talk later. Immediately after this brief exchange of words, the two men return to the fight. The fight turns out to be much more difficult than Mose had anticipated. Each of the soldiers is extremely strong. The hero then uses his skill, Atoria's fencing, and aggressively attacks. Only after a while does Mose realize that he has stepped too deep into the enemy's army, and thus finds himself in an awkward situation. He collides with Kea's back, and asks if she's okay. He tells her not to worry, as he will do everything to protect her. Kia smiles at these words, then says he doesn't need to, because she is perfectly capable of taking good care of herself. She tells her friend to do the same as well. The swordsman agrees with her words, and decides to do his best. Then he notices that Lidorn is standing in front of him. The prince is standing on a high cliff. They maintain eye contact for a moment, after which they both throw themselves into the fight. The hero stops his opponent's attack, but is unable to hold it for too long. He jumps off, and falls to the ground, having been affected by the stun effect. He is dizzy, when at the same moment Lidorn appears right in front of him, with the intention of dealing the final blow. Mose is protected with a shield by his friend which enrages the prince. He asks how dare he get in his way, and if he knows why he has the nickname White Wolf of Logis. He explains that it's because anyone who gets in his way will be crushed to death by his white wolf fangs. Then a sword appears from behind the shield man and pierces him. Mose is terrified, and the man suffers from the inflicted attack. The shield man says goodbye to his friend, and his character slowly disappears. Lidorn is ready to kill Mose now as well. The swordsman is filled with rage and rises up supported by his sword, which is now covered in flames. Atoria's effect and solar rage are activated. This is a limited skill that only activates with all Atoria equipment when forcibly activated through the emotion of rage. Mose is ready to do anything to defeat his opponent. He swings his sword, and an incredibly active exchange of blows begins. Mose's skill takes away his health, however. His strength and speed increase significantly. The attacks from the swordsman become more aggressive, and his strength increases. Even Lidorn himself notices this. Mose's strength and speed increase once again. Mose takes a strong swing and strikes which throws the opponent really far away. Lidorn says that it looks like the immortals also know how to be angry after the death of a comrade. Mose tells him to shut up. 40% of his health is taken away in exchange for 200 points of strength and speed. The opponents exchange more blows, and Lidorn talks about how, after all, Mose's comrade is an immortal who will come back to life. And yet Mose feels such rage. He tells him to imagine what fury he felt when he was given the opportunity to experience an eternal farewell to his beloved. With these words, the prince attacks with tremendous force. Mose can't believe it as he sees his opponent's level rise, and the enemy becomes even more powerful. Lidorn challenges the immortals and says that they are outlaws and not qualified to walk in this world. He tells Mose to plunge to his own death, that this is the punishment to which he condemns him. A blade appears behind the swordsman, the same one that killed his friend, and soon pierces him as well. Mose mortally wounded immediately falls to the ground. Lidorn says that the players don't own this world. So why are they destroying it at will? He asks the question of why they decide the fate of those he loves with their dirty hands. He demands an answer from Mose, and then the swordsman's friends appear to finally help him. Mose shouts to them so they'll run away, but it is too late. Lidorn's blade reaches Guile, and Sharon is terrified. Lidorn tells Mose to feel helpless when the blade retaliates against his beloved people. The hero in despair screams for him to stop when at the same moment the blade begins to materialize behind Sharon's back. At that very moment, Kellyan appears and saves the terrified girl. Both the enemy and Mose himself are shocked, as Kellyan and Sharon have disappeared, and only Lidorn's sword itself remains before their eyes. The fighting on the battlefield continues. Kia kills a griffin when it suddenly starts to rain, making battle conditions much more difficult. Kia notices a friend struggling with an enemy leader. Mose screams and asks Lidorn to stop it. However, he stays unfazed and asks why he should stop. He calls the players hypocrites, cursed monsters, and anger grows in him once again. He says that the pain the hero feels being immortal in this world is nothing more than an artificial emotion. After a moment, he adds that a few days are enough for his loved ones to return to this world. He is filled with visible grief, and Mose is increasingly shocked. Lidorn says that his beloved wife was killed by players like Mose. They kept returning no matter how many times he killed them. 
Lidorn says their last words were that they should stop playing this stupid game. The prince points out how players treat this world as just some game. Mose is deeply moved by these words, and notes the truth in what Lidorn says. After a certain amount of time, the Solar Rampage ability is turned off. Lidorn tells him that he knows that not all players are like this. However, it's always them, sowing confusion without any responsibility. That's why he arrived with the intention of solving the problem. He asks Mose if he still thinks he has the right to stop him. The hero is paralyzed. He realizes that Lidorn is right however he can't back down now. He has to continue, even only because of the others who are still fighting. He is the only one who can defeat the enemy leader. Lidorn throws himself at Mose to attack while exposing himself, and the hero wants to use this to attack him. This turns out to be a fake, and a spectral blade once again appears behind Moe's. The sword attacks again, and the swordsman has only 20% of health points left. Moe's falls down feeling that this could be his end. Then he hears Kia calling out to him and sees her running. Lidorn points out that she is not one of the immortals. A terrified Moe's, who is also well aware of this, tells his friend to run away. Lidorn also turns to the girl asking if she knows the player and if she would be able to sacrifice her irreplaceable life for the sake of this immortal. Mose further tries to stop his friend however, she answers the question, saying that the player is someone precious in her heart. Even if he is immortal, she can't let his eyes close even for a moment. She says she is ready to put her life on the line on his behalf, and other things don't matter. Lidorn doesn't understand Kia's attitude. The elven girl adds that she also doesn't judge what the prince plans to achieve, she challenges him to a duel, which he accepts. A blade appears behind the girl immediately, seeing that Mose throws his own sword, and because of that, he saves his friend's life. Lidorn is shocked at how he dares to even interfere. The hero summons Sharma as the prince approaches him, and the weapon while appearing pierces Lidorn's chest. Mose is sure he has won, but the prince says it's not over. He says that he is the spark that ignited the small fire. Lidorn says he has done his job, and soon other sparks will revive the flames of conflict. Eventually with these words, he dies. The mission is completed with the defeat of the enemy leader, and the player's level increases. The hero seems to slowly process the recent events after which he throws himself at Kia, asking why she did such a thing. He is shaken, and doesn't know what he would have done if his friend had died. Kea replies that it had to be done to defeat Lidorn, and hugs her friend. Mose asks that the woman never do such a thing again. The elf agrees, and tells him to pray for the peace of the souls of the defeated. The swordsmen continue in an embrace amidst the rain. Lidorn's shocking story has caused many changes in circuit. Groups against the players began to form in the Logis Empire and neighboring countries. These were people who banded together to do Lidorn's will, and innocent players suffered again. Meanwhile, the White Tower announced the stigma of magic, which allows everyone to identify the troll players. The Information Guild set a bounty on such players, and both players and game characters began to hunt them down. Mose reviews the news. His ship has become popular on various websites which has made it much more difficult to navigate. People continue to discuss whether the Sky Ruler character is a player or a game character, but just in case, Mose decides to be careful. After the fight with Lidorn, Mose wasn't feeling well. Kia helped him a lot to get back together, and suggested that he visit her hometown with her. That is why they are now heading to Azarus. Elsha informs Mose that preparations for his training are complete. So he goes down to the training room, and the spirit casts strengthening and protective spells on the walls of the ship. The swordsman gets ready, and summons the Sharma in his left hand, and the Lidorn sword in his right. This is his second engraved sword, Korma, the sword that killed his friends. This sword also has a legendary rank. With it, he also gained a new skill. Together, the two swords create an effect that allows him to throw blades with just a few commands. This will allow the hero to attack from a distance. However, there is one problem. The swords thrown by Moe's return to him. He catches Sharma, and after a while, also Korma. However, shortly after that, he falls over. The swordsman isn't able to fully control the swords. He feels frustrated by this and is afraid that because of this, he won't be able to protect his friends, even though they put so much faith in him. He fears that he will lose everyone because of this, which makes him feel motivated to become even stronger. He gets up with the intention of training until he can grab his swords. Mose leaves the room battered and tired from his training. 
he notices Kia waiting for him. The girl gives him clothes to change into. It is a high-class linen shirt from Azarus. Kia says he should wash and wear these clothes because it's something worn in her hometown. Moe's thanks her and goes to get ready. All the while he thinks about how he must become stronger to defend his loved ones. Two men are talking in the darkness. One of them asks if the other has brought the thing, to which the latter replies that he did, addressing the first man as the director. The thing was acquired the same day and is still warm. The director is excited. Holding a small ball in his hand, he says that this is the reason he can't stop playing circuit. Mose is impressed by the free city, Azarus, and especially by the size of the buildings in its center. Kia explains that the White Tower, the alchemists of Ruse, and the secret servants of the Empire, all of these organizations experimented on this land without restriction. After these experiments, the environment became hideous. It was impossible for life to thrive there. However, Gaisa, the sage of the elves, gave the blessing to this land in exchange for his soul. This is how the city of Azarus was founded. Mose asks why the city is called free. Kea explains that it is because it has no ruler. Mose asks what happens when someone commits transgressions. The girl answers that then the representatives of each race, elders of Azarus, gather for a trial. That's why you can hear many different opinions in this city. Mose is fascinated. Some time ago he played this game just to be able to make money, and now he was given the opportunity to experience what he completely didn't deserve. He met his first friends and tried playing in a team. He joined the swordsmen and began to form important relationships with people. And even in the final battle with Lidorn, he decided that he would defend everyone. He is snapped out of his thoughts by Kia. She grabs his hand and says they have to move because there are still many places she wants to show him. Mose, seeing his friends smiling, vows to himself once again that he will always protect her. Soon, the friends found themselves in a nearby tavern delighted by local specialties. At one point, Kia was spotted by a man who says they haven't seen each other in a long time. The girl is happy to see him and introduces him as Lorad, her old friend. It turns out that the man is a famous vocalist who never forgets a sound he once heard. The dwarf is embarrassed by his friend's words and greets Mose with a smile on his lips. Lorad quickly notices the ring on Mose's finger and is surprised to learn that he is also a sorter. He wonders what mission brought them to Azurus. Kia explains that they are here on vacation, and the dwarf apologizes for his question. But the girl laughs and says she understands him because sorters always bring some trouble with them. After a moment, Lorad says that's why he thought Kia was here to investigate this incident. Surprised Kia, not knowing what's going on, asks what incident he has in mind. And after a moment, Lorad pulls a small ball wrapped in a piece of paper out of his pocket. It turns out to be a new drug recently available on the market. The specific is called Venetic, and is absorbed through the skin. The dwarf explains that it is very easy to get it in Azharus, and even children would have no problem getting one. Surprised, Kia wonders why the drug is so easy to obtain, as the Azharus elders firmly forbid the trafficking of such substances. Lorad explains that many players gathered in Azharus, and the city itself developed a lot thanks to the factories they built. In the beginning, everything was fine, but no one even knows when the drug began to be sold in every bar. Just when Lorad is about to say who the people who sell it are, a suspicious group of men enters the tavern. The surprised dwarf falls silent for a second, and after a moment, looking towards the men, he adds that they are the ones distributing the drug. The men are players, and belong to the same guild. They produce all sorts of healing potions in their factory, but Lorad suspects that this is probably where they also produce the drug. Mose pays special attention to the fact that the dealers are players. After a while, Kia asks about the name of their guild. Lorad reveals that the guild is called Pickup Artists. A party full of drunk people is happening at the guild headquarters. A servant talks to the director, informing him that they currently have three half-elves and six limpuses. The director is enraged by the number of half-elves. He recalls that he said he needed all five of them. Another guild member reassures the man by saying that the elves available for the night are from Valum, and the director agrees that the half-elves from Valum are amazing. The man licks his lips and finally says to bring them in and to not harm the goods in the process. At the same time, a dealer we met earlier also appears in the room. The man asks the director if he has already made a final decision. After a moment, he adds that he saw something interesting in the bar yesterday, 
namely a half-elven woman in the company of a strange player. The man pulls a photo out of his pocket, and the director reacts to what he sees with great excitement. He says this is exactly what he wanted. He orders the half-elf to be brought in as soon as possible while laughing like a crazed pervert. The photo shows a smiling Kia. On the next day, the sorters are in their temporary house. Kea serves Moe's a meal prepared according to a recipe from Azaras. Surprised Moe's can't believe that Kia prepared it with her own hands. Moe's eats delighted with his friend's cooking, and the girl is pleased that she has managed to hit his taste. After a while, Kia informs the man that her friends, Shira and Farah, who she really wanted to introduce to Moe's, are coming later. At the same moment, the door opens, and Lorad rushes into the room with a shout on his lips, summoning the sorters. Surprised Moe's spits out the last bite of his meal straight at the girl, who is not too happy about it. Moe's asks what happened, and the dwarf informs them that they have a very big problem and need to go somewhere immediately. The action moves to the hospital. There's a lot of confusion inside due to the poisoning. The swordsmen are shocked to see what is happening, especially Kia. The girl in the hospital sees her friends. Farah is lying on one of the beds screaming loudly and begging for the drug, while a distraught Shira is kneeling by her side. The woman is in a very serious state. She begs for the drug while scratching all over her body. Something catches Moses' attention. There are strange symptoms visible on the girl's neck. A distraught Kea asks Lorad to explain to her what's going on. The dwarf explains that the girls were forced to take the drug by dealers. At his words, the terrified sorters are shocked. Mose recalls the faces of the men they met in the tavern. At the same moment, the silence caused by Lorad's words is broken by an even louder scream of a girl begging for drugs. Mose is furious because of the guild's bestial behavior. Not only did they smuggle drugs into the city, but they also forced his companion's friends to take them. The man turns to the crying girl. With a terrifying look on his face, he tells her that he intends to destroy those who are responsible for all this. Kia asks if the man swears by the name of the goddess, and a determined Mose does so without hesitation. Around this time, Circuit Master, the largest online community, was busy with two incidents. The first was the All Search, an exploration team funded by the Information Guild, who had finally found the sacred treasure after a long nine-month search. The treasure was the Eye of New Mankind, a fossil left by Ordifus, a giant who was called a great prophet in the past. This discovery revealed that the new species, whose arrival in this world was predicted by Orthopus, were all players. In contrast, the second high-profile topic was Venetic, a very potent drug that if not taken again within 24 hours of the first dose, will cause severe poisoning, accompanied by dangerous consequences. Poisoning from the drug can even lead to death, and there is no antidote for it. The poisoning effect could only be removed by high-class alchemists or mages who know a certain special spell. However, most alchemists already belonged to guilds or were sponsored by factories, and this made hiring even one very expensive. What's more, mages were also hard to find due to the fact that they were simply scarce. Because of how difficult it was to deal with the effects of poisoning, all the victims of the drug quickly became its slaves. It is late in the evening. The action moves to one of the clubs. Our sorters appear on the stairs in front of the entrance to the club. They got information about the location of this place from Lorad. The dwarf had earlier told his friend about how Shira and Farah had received an invitation to the Troll Tongue. That was the name of this club. Their birthdays were coming up, and the place was going to be visited by their favorite bard, so it really made them very happy. Lorad blamed himself because he couldn't stop them, and Kea, listening to his explanation, fought an inner urge to murder. Back to the present. The girl thanks her friend for deciding to go with her. Kia warns Mose that she intends to rip the bodies of her enemies to shreds, even if she has to sell her soul to the devil. However, Mose says he has no intention of holding back either. It is because of people like this that stories like Lidorn's misfortune are created. The Sorters decide to move into action. However, as soon as they approach the entrance they are stopped by security guards. It turns out that the entire building has been rented by a very important guest and no one can just walk in. However, Half-elves like Kea are an exception, and can use all the services for free, and that too because of a special important guest. Mose doesn't want to leave her friend alone, but the security guards are adamant and won't allow anyone who isn't a half-elf to enter. As Mose begins to lose control, at the same moment Kia decides to go inside alone. 
A terrified Mose wants to stop her, but she tells him not to worry and just wait for her. The girl is only going to look around and after a while, leave. Mose, however, is afraid that something will happen to her. The elven girl, grabbing his hand, asks for just two hours. If the girl does not return by that time, then Mose can do whatever he wants. Eventually, Mose agrees to his friend's proposal. The two of them say the words of the swordsman's oath, and the girl eventually enters the building alone, saying that she will return soon. Mose feels like tearing down the entire building, however. He realizes that he must control himself because he fully trusts his friend. Meanwhile, as soon as Kia was inside, she was immediately targeted by the same man they had met earlier in the tavern. Some time passes. There is a fierce party in the club, and a determined Kia walks through the crowds of partying people. With focus and anger, she looks around for the people who hurt her friends. Suddenly she is interrupted by a man asking if she came here alone. He turns out to be the dealer the girl saw in the tavern. Realizing this, the elf replies with a smile that she is alone, and that this place has definitely piqued her interest. The man quickly approaches her, embraces her, and says he can show her around if she wants. The girl feels like tearing him apart on the spot, but is well aware that she still has to restrain herself. Instead, Kia puts a smile on her face and agrees to his proposal, in the meantime, probably wondering how she will kill him. Meanwhile, outside, in front of the building, an impatient Mose walks around having a hard time waiting for his friend. Suddenly he is pulled out of his thoughts by his own name. It was Kia. The man asks if she's okay, and if something happened. The girl replies that her ears hurt a little, but otherwise everything is fine. After a moment she adds that it would be better if they asked the man she brought with her. It was a pacified and bound drug dealer she met inside. The man yells that the girl doesn't realize who he is, and that she should let him go. He talks about the impact he has on the city, and that she won't get away with it. However, Mose has somewhat different plans for the criminal. Without warning, he deals a blow piercing the man's chest, and the dealer starts screaming in pain on the ground. An enraged Mose threatens that the man better answer his questions honestly, because if he doesn't, he'll show him what real hell is. The dealer for the time being decides to listen to the sorter and begins to feign remorse, promising to never do it again. Mose tells him to raise his head and look at the drug he is holding in his hand, asking if they are the ones producing it. The dealer refuses to answer, but holding a sword in his hand, Mose warns him not to try anything stupid. In the end, it turns out that the drug is made by a man named Jason, and he has no idea what the process is like. Jason is a level 57 alchemist and an employee of director Choi. The man is a director at one of the companies founded by the players. Kia notes that this is the same company that Lorad mentioned to them earlier. The scared dealer says that he has already told everything he knew, and that if he is caught revealing information, he will be killed immediately. He throws himself on the ground and asks for forgiveness. Mose watches his friend, who looks at the criminal in disgust. Eventually the girl says they have already found out everything they wanted, and that they should just leave this thrash alone. The man, recognizing that this time he has succeeded, promises to himself that he will remember their faces, and will definitely kill them. However, at the same moment, Mose stops, and points out that the man has committed a lot of bad deeds. Just in case, he decides to take care of him properly, so that the man won't be able to take revenge on them later. Mose slowly approaches the terrified dealer, saying that the man must get what he deserves. Soon the night's silence is broken by a loud scream filled with pain. Sitting in a special VIP room, the impatient director wonders what is taking the dealer so long. One of his subordinates turns to him and assures him that he needn't worry because he'll get it eventually. The director, however, gets even angrier, and shouting when he will finally get it, throws the alcohol straight at the man's face. He says he handled them too gently, and that just because they produce drugs doesn't mean they mean anything at all. He doesn't care that they produce drugs if he has to wait so long for delivery. The humiliated man apologizes and assures that he will get the product as soon as he can. However, the director also takes out his frustration on the lower level guild members. He throws a bottle of alcohol at the frightened men, and they hastily flee the room. The exasperated director pours alcohol into his mouth and wonders aloud where the dealer went. A short time later, the lost man was found by other guild members. He was in a very bad condition, seemed extremely frightened and kept repeating thank you and I'm sorry. Finally one of the people who found him leans over him and hands him something that looks like a potion. 
The concoction worked, and the by now terrified dealer regained consciousness. He quickly recounted that he had been kidnapped, and after that, he was tortured by a half-elf and a player. The second man wonders if these are the same people the director mentioned. He also points out that everything must have taken place recently, and they certainly haven't gone very far yet. Eventually, he gives his people the order to contact the remaining guild members and destroy everything in Azarus. The man says that Moe's and Kia will pay for what they have done, and officially declares war on them. Soon, the entire village stands in flames. People are lying on the streets with numerous injuries. Some are even dead. All this is observed by a terrified Moe's, who has only just arrived on the scene. The situation looks very bad, and the fire is consuming every single building in the area. He is snapped out of his surprise by a loud shout from his friend. When Mose quickly runs into the building, he finds that the perpetrators have left a message on the wall. It bears an inscription telling them to come to the troll tongue if they want to save the dwarf. Upset Mose realizes that the criminals destroyed the entire village just to get to them. Angry Kia, on the other hand, is no longer able to stand what the enemy guild has committed. An elf with the name of the god of sorters on her lips promises to tear her opponents to pieces. Without thinking, the sorters turn around and head toward the troll tongue again. New news during Circuit TV broadcast. The reporter and many other players gathered at the site where the recently found artifact, the Eye of a New Mankind, is now located. It was reported that the artifact is about to show its power. Soon, the ground around begins to shake, and a sacred artifact appears above a nearby cathedral. After a while, the eye flashes with an incredibly bright light. The entire city is illuminated by its glow, and the gathered people have no idea what is happening. As the blinding light faded, a mysterious message appeared in the sky. In fact, it was a system message activated by the power of the artifact. As of this moment, an official ranking based on the fame of each single player will be created. What's more, any player will be able to check where he or she currently stands at any time. Until now, there has been no such thing as an official ranking in the game, so all players are incredibly excited. The system reveals the top of the ranking. Mose is in first place, and by a huge margin, the action again moves to the troll tongue. Guild members are wondering what this new ranking is. One of them notes that it's definitely related to a new artifact that was recently found. They pay attention to the player in first place, and state that apparently he has nothing to do, that's why he has so many points. Meanwhile, the director continues to inquire about when his goods will arrive, and the man assures him that the shipment has recently left. The goods, however, turned out to be wilder than expected, so it will have to be tamed first. The director smiles, saying it's boring if the goods are too obedient. At the same moment, there is a loud sound. It was Moe's and Kia, who broke down the door and entered the center of the VIP room. Surprised by the speed with which his goods arrived, the man finds that the elf looks even better in person. Kia was the very goods he ordered. The director admits he expected a lot less and says he can't take it anymore. He orders his subordinates to bring him the girl. The man in the suit turns out to be the founder of the Guild of Pickup Artists. His name is Jason. Pulling out a magic wand, he threatens the sorters because of what they did to his men earlier and soon gives the remaining members the order to attack. They are only interested in the girl and Mose is expendable so they can get rid of him. At the same time, a notification appears. The guild pickup artists have entered into hostile relations with the player Mose. The sound of that name catches Jason's attention. After a while he realizes it's the top ranked player, but it's already too late. Boiling with a frightening thirst for revenge, Mose stands ready to fight. The man utters the name of the skill, and his two legendary swords massacre all members of the enemy guild in just a few seconds. Jason can't believe he's met the man at the top of the rankings. He wonders why such a person even is in this place. Meanwhile, Mose is efficiently reducing guild members to the status of corpses. The man, seeing what's happening, quickly realizes that he has to run away because he doesn't stand a chance against him. At the same moment, one of the swords points in his direction. Jason quickly uses the barrier, but such a weak spell is unable to stop Moses' blades. The barrier was shattered with just one blow. The man can't believe it, but he checks the swords and everything becomes clear. It was the power of the legendary sword named Korma. The terrified men freeze motionless, 
realizing that they have messed with someone they should never mess with. At the same moment, the unleashed weapon pierces him through. Mose effectively catches his swords. Only Director Choi is left now. Terrified by what was happening, the director immediately began to flee. Unable to believe that in a place like this, he has stumbled upon a player who is ranked number one. The man heads for the back exit. When he reaches the car, he immediately uses the crystal ball to contact his subordinates. He orders a group of security guards to come to the company's headquarters immediately, and he himself heads to the same place by car. Upon arriving at his destination, he is greeted by assembled security guards. Among those gathered is Director Park, who confronts the man, asking if he has been taking drugs again. It turns out that the Information Guild has marked the Pickup Artist Guild as a target for liquidation. The man, however, says that it's unimportant at this point because something has happened that will make each of the guild members end up dead. Before they can take care of other things, this very problem must be addressed by Director Park first. The man orders his subordinate to deal with the approaching enemies, and he himself opens the huge armored door. Director Park announces that they will stop anyone who tries to get in. Meanwhile, the drug addict holding the item says that with this, even Moe's won't be able to beat him. The secret item is an earring that increases every stat by 33, and even adds the ability to strengthen the body. Some time passes, and the sorters manage to find the headquarters of the drug addict director. However, as soon as they approach the door of the building, they are stopped by Director Park and his men. Mose orders him to shut up and bring him Director Choi. If they do this, he will spare their lives. The man, however, has a different proposal. He presents Mose with a suitcase filled to the brim with tokens, and each one is worth a thousand gold coins. Director Park asks what the swordsmen think of such a generous offer. But an angry elf woman interrupts his words, saying that what Choi has committed cannot be dealt with using gold. The drug addict has messed with her friends, and on top of that, has caused them to become addicts as well. However, the man states that the girl has no evidence to confirm her words. He thinks that by telling such lies, they will destroy the good name of their company. But Mose doesn't give a damn about their company, and once again orders him to bring Choi. Hearing this, Park warns them that Choi is not a person they can handle. Kia cannot believe that a man is taking the side of a common murderer like Choi. Park, however, doesn't think an artificial intelligence like Kia understands anything at all. Hearing these words, Mose orders him to shut up immediately, because otherwise, he will rip his face out. The assembled opponents do not take Mose seriously, laughing at his threats, and Director Park wonders if Mose is capable of taking responsibility for his actions. He tells him to better prepare to leave the game. Mose, however, draws his sword, asking if that's all the man wanted to say. A notification appears before the eyes of the surprised director. A player named Mose declared war. The man smiles, seeing that just two people are declaring war on the entire organization. At the same moment, something slams into one of the people standing near him. It was Kia who started killing everyone one by one with incredible speed. Measuring her enemies with a fearsome gaze, the girl swears by the god of blades that she will kill all of them. The fight continues, and with every blow the elf woman deals, Director Park's ranks dwindle. Kia's sword is dripping with the blood of her enemies. Meanwhile, Mose took care of all the other opponents and turned his attention to Park. The surprised man tells them not to do things they will regret later, but his words are cut short by a quick and decisive cut. Mose dealt the blow saying that the man should say this to himself. After a while, he added, the Park should abandon any thoughts of logging back online. Soon after, Mose deals the final blow and kills the man. Director Park sits in some room with an earring in his ear. It turns out that this is the room where the elf's friend Lorad is also being held. Director Park plans to set the place on fire, and in the same way get rid of all evidence of his illegal activities. He plans to publicly admit that the cause of the fire was a player who trespassed the company grounds, and one of the Ajarus elders, Swamp Sage, who is on his side will investigate, and the whole thing will end very quickly. Of course, in his favor. At the same time, Mose and Kia roam the corridors full of darkness. At one point, a confident director Choi stands in their way. He addresses Mose directly, saying that he is honored that someone so famous has come such a long way just to see him. Kia, seeing the man standing in front of her, is unable to control her emotions and quickly throws herself in his direction with the intention of attacking. However, 
As soon as she delivers the blow, light flashes around the man, and the surprised elf realizes that her attack did not reach its target. Director Choi caught her sword with his bare hand without any problem. The man took a sweep, preparing to deliver a powerful blow, but at the same moment Mose stepped in, and his strike with great force threw the man away. Mose had no intention of letting anything bad happen to his friend. Despite the powerful blow dealt by the swordsman, Director Choi quickly rose from the ground, and after a moment attacked again, running towards them. Choi attacked Mose, but the latter had no trouble at all dodging his attacks. However, he was not going to prolong it. He summoned his swords and gave them the command to attack, and they immediately pierced the enemy. The surprised man realized that in the face of Mose's power, not even the legendary earring would help him. What's more, Kia noticed that something was wrong, and with one quick cut, she cut off the man's ear. Of course, along with the earring, which was located right there. At the same moment, Mose, who was standing over the man, said that Director Choi had just lost. It was finally over. The next day, because of all these events, an entire Azarus was in chaos. The Information Guild immediately launched an investigation. They looked at all kinds of criminal activity in the city, including drug production, but also the arson of one of the largest factories. To get to the truth more quickly, the Azarus elders and the Information Guild convened a special public hearing. Surprisingly, it was Mose and Kea who were named prime suspects. Mose couldn't understand how, in the face of all the deeds of the hostile guild, they were the ones being treated as suspects, but Kia was sure that nothing would happen to them. The session soon began, and the Swamp Elder was to be the first to ask questions. The way he looked at them seemed very suspicious to Mose. The Elder began his questioning by determining what the Sorters and the Pickup Artists Guild have in common. He accused them of setting fire to the factory on the Guild's orders. He also did not forget to mention that Mose and Kia are Sorters. Mose, hearing the whispers of the gathered people, didn't want the interrogation to go down the wrong way, and proudly admitted that they were indeed both Sorters. However, the Swamp Elder quickly interrupted him by pointing out that Sorters usually deal with secret missions. He also said that this time their secret mission was to start a fire. Hearing these words, Kia immediately denied it. But according to the Elder, this only confirmed that he was right. No one would admit they were carrying out a secret mission. Thinking about the events of the previous night, Mose recalled that one of the directors had mentioned an elder working with them. It seemed that this was the man in question. Meanwhile, the elder turned toward those gathered, asking if they knew who was responsible for everything. People unanimously agreed that they all realized that what happened was the work of the Pickup Artist Guild. The elder continued by saying that they were right, and that's why the guild commissioned the sorters to set the fire. This is because they wanted to get rid of suspicious stares and redirect them to someone else. Hearing these words, Kia couldn't stand it and shouted that sorters don't accept such dirty missions. However, according to the Elder, this proves nothing. And the fact that they always say their missions are secret is very suspicious and works against them. He also suggested that the sorters should be brought before the Barvid Tribunal and receive an appropriate prison sentence in the Medium spell. A concerned Mose noted that thanks to the Elder's speech, the people gathered in the hall began to treat them as criminals, even without any evidence. At this point, someone else spoke up. Someone who noted that Swamp Elder also has no concrete evidence. A mysterious man appeared in the hall claiming that no investigation had actually been conducted. The man's name was Zyke, and he held a high 211th level. The man introduced himself as the Platinum Head of the Information Guild, and looking at the documents along the way, noted that with such a case there should be a thorough investigation. He also noted that it is far too early to pass judgment unless Swamp Elder has some reason not to delay. After a short speech by the mysterious man, the atmosphere in the hall completely changed. Mose noticed this and wondered who this person might be. It seemed that this was no ordinary member of the Information Guild, and all the more, Mose didn't understand why he was helping them. The Swamp Elder insisted that the mere fact that Sorters desecrated Azharas should be subject to punishment, and the fact that they accept secret missions is proof enough. However, the mysterious man took the initiative again, and noted that, according to what he was able to find out, the Sorters were currently on vacation. At the same time, he asked why the two of them were on the site of the burned factory. Kia confessed that one of her friends fell victim to the drug which forced her to launch an investigation on her own. The results of the investigation were that the Guild of Pickup Artists and the NGE Tech Company were working together, and when they tried to find the director, 
that's when the fire broke out. At these words, the mystery man also demanded proof. But unfortunately, everything was consumed by fire. The swamp elder laughed at the elf woman's story. He said that of course she had no evidence because she made it all up. However, the man in the blue cape once again stressed the importance of the events, saying that they must conduct a thorough investigation and do everything correctly from the beginning. In the end, all the other elders agreed with him. More members of the Information Guild appeared in the hall announcing that Moe's and Kia must immediately come directly to their headquarters. Suddenly there was a loud shout. All those gathered in the hall immediately turned around, and after a moment, wide smiles appeared on the faces of the sorters. Lorad, barely alive, entered the hall, saying that he had been kidnapped by Director Choi. After a while, he added that he had come to deliver the final evidence in the case. At these words, both Mose and Kia were shocked because they had no idea what this final proof could be. Besides, they were not the only ones, as everyone gathered in the hall couldn't believe what they had just heard. And even the Swamp Elder could not ignore Lorad's words. At the same moment, the dwarf showed everyone his neck and the memory crystal on it. It was a crystal that Lorad installed in his body when he was still working as a soldier in the Information Division. As soon as the man touched the crystal with his fingers, the device began to emit light, and a pre-recorded voice carried across the hall. Mose and Kia recognized it immediately. It was the voice of Director Choi. The recording coming from the crystal was the director's last words just before the factory was set on fire. The surprised Swamp Elder could not accept what he had just heard, but at the same moment, a voice recorded on the crystal said that it was the Swamp Elder who would handle the investigation. As the recording came to an end, Lorad once again said that he had been kidnapped. They wanted to use him to take revenge on sorters who launched a drug investigation. If he had not managed to break free and escape, he would have lost his life in the fire, which was set by Director Choi himself. At this point, the Swamp Elder realized that he had just stepped into quite a swamp. Lorad's testimony caused the attitude of the man in blue to change dramatically. With one mighty leap, the man found himself right in front of the Elder. Listing all the losses the residents in the city suffered, he smiled and noted that the Elder had officially become an accomplice in this horrific crime. After a while, he also promised him that he would do everything in his power to have him sent to prison, and that all those involved in the incident would be imprisoned with him. The man directed his sinister gaze at the pair of surprised sorters after a moment, then smiled kindly at them. After a while the man, turning to all those gathered, announced that the hearing was over. The sorters turned out to be completely innocent, and even more, because the booming trade of illegal substances in Azarus has been solved mainly thanks to their actions. At these words, a light appeared under Moses' feet, and a moment later came notifications informing him of as many as five levels gained. He also earned another achievement, the Savior of Azarus, which provided him with a huge boost to all stats and an incredible amount of fame. Looking at the content of the achievement, Mose couldn't believe what he was seeing. All he could do was just smile. Shortly after these events, an extensive article describing the whole affair appeared on the internet. Everything was described in great detail, and the article immediately gained tremendous attention. This is due to the fact that the one who worked out the drug problem was none other than the famous Mose, a top-ranked player and owner of a golden airship. In Azarus, a large group of people gathered in the city's main square. In the middle stood Mose, addressing everyone and thanking them for their good treatment. However, the Azarus elders were of a different opinion and felt that they should do much more in return for his services. The truth is that they made a hasty judgment, despite the fact that Mose helped them so much. As an apology, they decided to give Mose a special gift. It was an item that had been in the possession of the elders since ancient times. It was a unique teleportation stone with which the user could teleport directly to Inteli. Surprised, Mose wondered if he could accept something so precious. But the Azarus elders wouldn't even hear an objection. In the end, Mose accepted the amazing gift. And soon after that, they said their goodbyes, and the sorters flew away on an airship still being led by the gazes of their new friends for a long time. We moved to a completely different place. Facing the attacker is an unknown man with a sword in his hand who asks him why he is doing this. After a moment there is a loud scream, blood gushes, and the man falls lifeless to the ground. A mysterious man dressed in black stands over his corpse. Suddenly two more people appear in the darkness, 
and kneeling on the ground, calling the man a master. The stranger, looking at the piece of paper he is holding in his hand, says that this must be the immortal who became a sorter. We can see a familiar ring on his finger. The men soon depart, leaving only dead bodies behind. Among them lies a piece of paper that the stranger held in his hand earlier, and on it, is a picture of Moe's. Somewhere in an unknown location, the unconscious Sharon is tied to one of the columns. Nearby there is a second person bound by a spell. The person admits in his mind that he didn't expect someone to manipulate the teleport coordinates. He seems to be clearly suffering. Tied between two columns stands Kellyon. He wonders if the person he is thinking of will be able to find their location. The person he is thinking about is, of course, Moe's. The man is suddenly snapped out of his thoughts. It was Kia, wondering what his next destination was. Moe's asks the elf if she remembers his friend Sharon, to which Kia admits that she does. It turns out that since the girl, along with Kellyon, disappeared from the battlefield during the fight with Lidorn, Moe's hasn't been able to contact her with the crystal ball. The range of the crystal ball is limited to places that the artifact's owner has visited at least once. And the only place Moe's has not yet reached is Tikris. Without hesitating, they chose this place as their next destination. Tikris is a city of nightlife and gambling. Its splendor and beauty are worthy of such an incredible reputation. However, Tikris also hides another, much darker side. Some time passes, and eventually Moses' airship arrives at the port of Tikris. Mose notes that due to a large number of huge and richly decorated ships, his own looks rather flimsy. But Kia believes that this only works in their favor, because that way their arrival didn't attract unnecessary attention. Suddenly, the friend's conversation is interrupted by a loud scream coming from a nearby alley. They were men cursing their bad luck, sitting at gambling machines. It seemed that everyone was trying to win something at all costs. There were many machines on both sides of the street, and each of them was occupied by someone. This sight shocks Mose, and Kia recalls that Lorad once told her that Tikris is a beautiful city, without a heart, where there is both hope and despair. At one point, an unfamiliar figure appears in front of them and asks if they also want to play. It was Poche, a guide on the street with machines. It turned out that the main prize was an Ormachan token worth a thousand gold pieces, but the token is only hidden in one of the machines, and everyone is trying to win that very prize. Nevertheless, this is only the main prize, and as Pochi assured them, they can win a lot of money by winning other prizes as well. Hearing his words, Moe's and Kia exchanged communicative glances. The elven woman also noticed the condition the stranger was in. He appeared to have many wounds. After a while, Kea, to her companion's surprise, asked Pochi for 10 coins to play with. And as soon as the rabbit ran off to fulfill her request, Kia said that since she had already bought the coins, they might as well play. In reality, she simply wanted to help the child a bit. She said that both, Poche and others similar to him, must be exploited simply because of being from the Limpu race. Moe's, who completely missed it, was shocked. According to the elf, all these creatures are forced into such work solely because of their race. She knows well what it feels like, as half-elves are forced to fight from a young age simply because they aren't human. After some time, Poch returns and hands the girl her ordered ten coins with a smile on his lips. However, just as he was about to leave, he was stopped by Moe's. The man handed the child a single gold coin. Pochi, at the sight of such a large sum, couldn't believe what was happening. Moe's, however, assured him that he should accept the gift, because he was giving it to him in gratitude for his kindness, but pointed out that he had to use it only when he really needed it. The stunned guide thanks him with tears in his eyes, and confesses that this will allow him to pay his siblings' medical bills. The rabbit bows low, thanking them once again, and wishing them much luck in their upcoming adventures. And after a while, he takes off emanating sincere happiness. Moe's and Kia, on the other hand, since they already have the coins, decide to test the machines standing nearby. Some time passes. Sorters stroll through the city joking about the fact that they lost all the coins they exchanged. However, not much time passes and soon they reach the local branch of the Information Guild. When they go inside, they are immediately greeted by a woman who says she was expecting them. After a while, the stranger uses a spell, the floor emanates blue light, and Moe's and Kia are transferred to their assigned room. Inside, someone was already waiting for them. The man introduces himself as Virens, and says he is the head of the local guild. 
The sorters sit down comfortably, and Virens gets straight to the point. He makes sure the sorters have arrived in the city in search of two people. Kia replies that they are looking for two players, one mage, and one archer. Virens notes that there are only a few immortals who are also mages, but admittedly some time ago, there were a few recruits in the White Tower. He says there was one player among them who immediately comes to mind, and his name is Kellyan. The sound of a familiar name immediately catches the attention of Moe's and the girl. Speaking further, Virens explains that normally the White Tower doesn't accept players as students. However, Kellyan hid his identity as a player, and pretended to be an ordinary resident so well that he managed to fool everyone. He faked it perfectly all the time, and eventually managed to graduate from the White Tower, and as one of the best students. Unfortunately, through all this, he became hated by many other students. Mose quickly pointed out that this could have been the perfect motive by which someone could hurt Kellyon. Viren says he is able to determine the exact location of the mage with his special ability. But before he can do that, the Sorters must complete a certain mission. Hearing these words, both Mose and Kia become very angry. Thanks to the pact between the Information Guild and the Sorters, the Information Guild should provide them with all the information they need for the investigation completely free of charge. Virens admits this is true, but this time the information is not one they usually give, so the Guild must get something in return. After a brief moment of consideration, the Sorters finally decide to at least listen to what he has to say. As the man explains, not far from the city there is a place called Marlock Mountain, and on this mountain, one can find an olive path. These are ruins in which a ghost appears, and it's this problem that the Sorters must solve. Mose wonders if he heard correctly that the case involves a ghost. Virens confirms but assures him that they won't need magic to defeat him, and the job can be done entirely with physical force. After a while, he adds, he has already prepared everything in advance, and the Sorters only need to give their best. Some time passes, and the friends are again roaming the streets of the city. Concerned Kia says the whole situation looks very suspicious. Mose, however, wonders if they really need to take care of the Viren's commission task and make their lives so difficult. Quite possibly, it would be better to simply return to Asparagon and continue to carry out the missions assigned to them by the Master. However, he is quickly pulled out of his thoughts by Kia. The girl says that although Kellyon is a stranger, Sharon is a friend of Moe's. Even if she is immortal, something could have happened to her. At this point, Moe's realized how selfishly he had acted. He was looking at the whole thing from the perspective of a mere player. And what's worse next to an elf who, after all, is a real inhabitant of this world. In the end, Moe's leads two lives. In one, he is an ordinary Lee Kiho, and in the other, he is Circuit's most famous player, Moe's. Kia confesses that she believes that he is different from the rest of the players. The man was the only player who took all the problems seriously and was always there to help her. Nevertheless, all the time there is a chance that Moe's will become like the rest. Still, Kia wants her friend to stay as he is. Hearing the girl's words, Moe's sinks into his own thoughts, but only for a brief moment because his gaze changes almost immediately. Mose grabs the elf's hand and at the same time apologizes for the way he looked at the whole thing. Sharon is indeed his friend, and he shouldn't even think that way. After a while, he also adds that he promises never to change. Time passes, and the Sorters continue to roam the streets of the city. At one point they notice a familiar face. It is Pochi hiding behind a wall. They approach him, and the rabbit visibly flinches upon hearing the elf's voice. It turns out that his face is all bruised and full of dried blood. A worried Kia immediately runs to him and asks what happened. It turns out that the child was beaten by a man named Suyuman. He is the owner of the street with the slot machines and Pochi's evil employer. What's more, the same guy also took away the gold coin that the rabbit had received earlier from Moe's, saying that a thief like him should be thrown to a ghost of the olive path. The sorters were strongly surprised to hear the familiar name, Several hours passed and it was already evening. The gate to the huge estate was guarded by two armed guards. It was Suyuman's house, and the sorters lurking nearby were wondering how to get inside. Kia noted that the security guard standing at the gate looked on alert, but clenching his fist, Moe said that sometimes security guards just fall asleep during their shift. At the same moment, a man is arguing with someone talking through a crystal ball. He says they need to send someone better this time, because the last one died in just a minute. 
It turns out that Suyaman contacted the head of the local information guild, and they discuss a joint plan, all of which is heard by the swordsman lurking under the stairs. The man says business is not going very well this month, because they have only collected 4,000 gold coins. He will probably have to spread the rumor that there are more tokens in the machines. After a while, he adds, he will have to punish the animal that tried to steal his gold. He was referring, of course, to Poach, and Kia hearing these words couldn't stand it. The elven woman quickly jumped out of hiding, even though the plan was different, and threw herself at the surprised man with all her momentum. One blow straight to the face was enough to send Suyuman to the ground. The terrified man began to call the guards, but in vain. No one would come to help. Thanks to Moe's, all the guards simultaneously fell asleep while on duty. With a smile on her lips, Kea announces that this is what will allow her to beat him unhindered. The girl quickly starts the work, and Moe's decides to leave her alone, just in case. After a long while, a self-satisfied Kia, wiping sweat from her forehead, announced that she was done. It was time to have a serious chat. Unfortunately, the beaten man sitting on the ground doesn't seem too eager to talk. It seems that he has no intention of revealing any information to them. However, his attitude changes very quickly when he sees that the psychopathic elf is about to deprive him of his life. It turns out that it's all about gambling. On the Olive Path, people gamble. The whole enterprise is overseen by a secret society called the Silver Cats, who have hired a necromancer to bind a powerful spirit to the place. This way, they secretly lure warriors to the ruins to fight him, and each fight is accompanied by a huge betting pool. However, no one has yet succeeded in defeating the summoned spirit. Anyone who has tried has been killed very quickly. An upset Kia catches the man exclaiming how many lives they have taken in the name of mere entertainment. But Moe's very quickly calms her down. It turns out that tomorrow's fight is going to be different from previous ones, because the person who is going to fight the ghost is very strong. Suyuman received this information from the head of the Information Guild. This only reinforced the swordsman's belief that the two men were carrying out this sick plan together. Having heard all the necessary information, the elf was already about to kill the man, but Moe's again stopped her, saying that she don't need to get her hands dirty at all. As soon as people learn that they have been victims of a swindler, they will bring justice to Suyuman themselves. The sorters decide to leave the man's fate in the hands of the deceived people, and Moe's decides to destroy all the Viren's plans. All in Telly is a huge library built by the elders of Azarus. It can only be entered by using a special teleportation stone made from the Avec tree. It was the stone that Moe's received from the elders in exchange for his recent achievements in Azarus. It seemed like the perfect time to check it out. Moe's asked his friend if she wanted to go with him, but she, as a resident of Azarus, decided to respect the will of the elders and let Moe's go alone. Instead, she asked him to find a certain book for her. Without delaying any longer, Moe's used the stone thus opening the portal. When he got to the other side, he found himself in All Intelli's huge library. At almost the same moment, a pop-up notification caught his attention. It was a new hidden task that involved finding the diary of the legendary blacksmith Lavanger. He was the artist responsible for the creation of eleven engraved swords, the same ones in the possession of Moe's. It seemed that if he found the diary and completed the task, he would be able to find the other swords. Moe's quickly decides to take up the search, but it occurs to him that he doesn't know how to do it. He tries to call the system's search function, but is only answered by silence. All indications point out that he will have to search the whole massive place with his own hands. Long hours pass, with scattered books and scrolls lying all around, and a weeping Moe's loudly cursing overly realistic gameplay. The search option wasn't available but the place was ultimately a library, so all the books were sorted accordingly. The problem was that each category contained hundreds of books. A determined Moe's wasn't going to give up, exclaiming that he had inexhaustible strength. Strengths, maybe. But he didn't have unlimited time. So he decided to check one last book and end his search for today. It just so happened that the last book turned out to be the blacksmith's sought-after diary. As the hidden task was completed, many more followed. Each one of the new tasks indicated the name and location of the next sword in the series of eleven engraved blades. One new task caught his attention. It was a task concerning the Sword of Zerma, which was located somewhere on the Olive Path. Surprised, Moe's did not expect such a coincidence, and after a while, 
He realized that if he had given up as he wanted to do earlier, he wouldn't have found the location of the next sword so quickly. It was all thanks to a friend who talked some sense into him. This discovery reassured him that he was on the right path, and before returning, he decided to look for the book the elf woman had asked him for. After returning from All Intelli, he noticed that his friend was nowhere to be found in the area. After a while, however, he found her, and it turned out that the girl had most simply fallen asleep awaiting his return. Mose quietly squatted beside her leaning against the bed while gazing at her beautiful sleeping face. Mose was already sure of this. He seemed to have fallen in love with this girl. Nevertheless, they belonged to two different worlds, so he didn't really know if he had any right to feel such emotions toward her. He would have liked Kia to feel the same way about him, but subconsciously he knew it was very selfish of him, which is why he remained silent all this time. He was snapped out of his thoughts by Kia waking up from sleep. The girl said he might have woken her up, but Mose quickly answered that he had just got back and handed her the book she asked him to find. Kia couldn't believe that he had actually managed to find it and thanked him really sincerely. She also added that she was very happy that they were friends, and Mose, hearing these words, could only cry inside. The sun was slowly setting, and that meant mission time was approaching. Heavily panting, Mose could barely stay on his feet, and blood was oozing from his numerous wounds. A man commenting on the fight loudly shouts that the people who bet money on him are going to lose them all. Sitting in the stands, Kia clenches her teeth unable to believe what she sees. Mose stands in the arena assuming a fighting position, with his two swords hovering beside him. Next to him stands a formidable opponent, the spirit of the Olive Path. To understand what happened, we need to go back in time a bit. Night has recently fallen. Near the ruins on the Olive Path, people who looked really rich began to gather. Each was greeted by a masked man, and then crossed a specially prepared barrier. A gold earring in the masked man's ear gave away his identity. The sorters hiding in the bushes rightly pointed out that it must be Virens, who let only people in masks through. These seem to be the visitors who have come to bet their money. The swordsman's plan was for the elven woman to get the mask belonging to one of the guests, which of course she easily did, and quickly gained a new identity. Another point in the plan was to bet a hundred tokens on Mo's winning. Kia, hearing such a huge number, thought she had heard wrong, but the man quickly assured her that he had no intention of losing. Eventually, Kia, hearing the certainty in his voice, agreed to bet the money. That's not all, however, because Mose revealed that he has an ace up his sleeve to ensure victory. When everything was ready, Mose approached Virens, who, pretending not to know him, asked him if he had come to fight. Mose confirmed and was directed inside. It turned out that he had to wait a while because other people would be fighting before him. There were a really large number of people in the stands around the arena, and among them sat Kia. Soon the silence all around was broken by the voice of the commentator welcoming all the nobles attending the event. The undefeated champion, the terrifyingly strong evil dream spirit, who has so far won in the arena as many as 31 times, has been announced. This is the strongest spirit the Silver Cat Association has managed to create so far. The spirit arose from an unlucky warrior who fell asleep on the Olive Path one day and was used in an experiment. It was through this that his soul was bound to the place for good. As for his first opponent, it was one of the players using the name Great Archer. Mose, who was watching the developments, also noticed this fact. He suspected that the player ended up here because he was tempted by the vision of winning a fortune. But in the face of such a strong opponent, his victory was rather doubtful. The fight began and the archer, taking the initiative, immediately sent several arrows towards the ghost. This one, however, deflected them all without the slightest problem, avoiding any damage. As a counterattack, the evil spirit decided to use his unique skill and threw his sword out of his hand. Mose noticed it immediately, there was no doubt. The ghost was using one of the engraved swords. Unfortunately, the archer didn't quite understand what was going on, because in a duel it's unlikely anyone would throw away his sword. At the same time, the evil spirit's weapon cut the player at a distance with full force. This was enough for the great archer to fall to the ground lifeless under his injuries. People gathered in the stands didn't find this sight strange at all, because this is how every person who challenged the spirit ended up. True, one fight was over, but the speaker, wasting no time, immediately announced the next duel, and the next fighter was, of course, the Sorter Mose. Hearing his rank, 
the people gathered in the arena began to wonder what a sorter performing secret missions was doing in a place like this. They began to suspect that he was clearly not being paid enough, and Kia was again forced to grit her teeth. It was at this point that she interrupted the noble's comments by shouting that she was betting a hundred tokens on him, which means a hundred thousand gold coins. All those gathered reacted to these words with undisguised disbelief, and in the meantime, the fight began. This time, the evil spirit took the initiative right from the start, and immediately aimed a blow straight at Moe's. However, Moe's merely uttered a command, and the opponent's attack was successfully blocked by his swords. The puzzled commentator noted that the sworder is also able to control his weapon from a distance, just like an evil spirit. At the same moment, Moe's counterattacked and sent his sword straight at his opponent, but the weapons penetrated him without inflicting any damage and he proved to be surprisingly fast and efficiently appeared right behind the man, after a moment, cutting him directly in the exposed side. Mose realized that physical attacks would be of no use to him in this fight, and he wasn't cut in half only because of the skill drawn from the earring. However, this wasn't the end. The opponent attacked, and Mose, ordering his swords, successfully repelled his attacks. The fight went on, and as time passed, it became clear that the swords in Moses' possession were not suitable weapons for this battle. When he controls them, their power focuses on thrusts, while the opponent's sword focuses on slashes, which effectively makes it difficult for a man to defend himself. Moreover, since physical attacks don't work on the spirit itself, then Moses must somehow directly deal with his sword. It seemed that Moses had to use this skill. His plan was to use a skill acquired from Lyro which allowed him to turn selected artifacts into a core. The problem was that its use required directly touching the object. In other words, he had to grab his opponent's sword. Mose, assuming a fighting stance, was ready to continue fighting, but it was clear that he was slowly receiving more and more damage. The situation wasn't improved by the commentator, who was looking for the downfall of the sworder. Sitting in the stands, Kia gritted her teeth tightly, fearing that Mose might really lose this time. The man once again shouted the command to attack and sent swords at his opponent. However, the evil spirit, using his skill, efficiently dodged his weapons and this time managed to decently damage Moe's. It looked like the end was near. The evil spirit raised his fist high above his head and his sword was in the same position but exactly over Moe's. However, the man realized that in order to stop the sword before he could touch it, he had to take on its attack. At the same moment, the opponent's blade penetrated deep into the sworder's body. But Mose was just waiting for this. He quickly grabbed the sword blade with his hand and shouted the name of the skill, Lucky Ruin. A flare of bright light obscured the entire arena, and the people sitting in the stands didn't have the slightest idea what had just happened. After a moment, the falling clouds of dust revealed Mose standing in the arena. And in turn, his opponent began to dissolve into thin air eventually disappearing and thanking the swordsman that at last someone had managed to free him from the curse. It looked like the fight was over. Mose, holding the core of his new sword, raised his hand in the air in a gesture of victory. Everyone gathered was shocked, including the commentator. After a while, however, they realized that they had all bet their money on the evil spirit, and thus lost everything. On the other hand, Kia, who bet as many as 100 tokens on her friend's victory, won as many as 231 thanks to the bet. The event on the Olive Path came to an end, and the sun began to rise. Returning to the city, a terrified Virens came across a stunned man who was one of his clients. It was at this point that he realized that the person who gained the fortune wasn't really one of the members. 231 tokens. Satisfied sorters sitting in their room rejoiced at the success of their plan. Nonetheless, Kia, who wasn't fully aware of the idea, constantly feared that Moe's would lose. Moe's admitted that this was also a gamble. He had no assurance that the skill would work, and if it didn't, he would certainly lose. Hearing his words, the girl asks if, in that case, he doesn't feel like betting a little more. But Moe's is sure he never wants anything to do with gambling ever again. After the truth about Suyaman's and Viren's deeds came to light, the Tikris Information Guild issued a wanted poster for Viren's, who disappeared overnight. Unfortunately, the influential Silver Cat organization wasn't even included in the reports due to the fact that high-ranking people belonged to it. Soon the Sorters visited the Information Guild again. This time they were spoken to by Lyrian, the new chief assigned to replace Virens. 
The swordsmen once again presented their case and revealed that they were looking for two players, a mage, and an archer. Lyrian was very familiar with Kelion's character. He managed to investigate in advance and trace the teleportation spell cast on the battlefield by the man. It was possible to determine the starting point of the spell, but discovering the endpoint proved impossible. Nevertheless, it emerged that one of the members of the White Tower, at the same time, used the forbidden spell Telepi, which allowed him to manipulate the coordinates of the teleportation spell. Everything indicated that when Kelion used the spell, someone changed its trajectory and brought him to a completely different place, which meant that both Kelion and Sharon were kidnapped. Fortunately, if there had been a murder in the White Tower, then the guild would have known about it immediately. So it can be assumed that they are still alive. Lyrian also added that if Mose wants to find them, then he must go to Lundabarun as soon as possible. At the same time, the place where Sharon and Kellyan are being held. Three mages face a man tied to pillars. Kellyan wonders how this happened. On the battlefield, he used a teleport and wanted to move them to the vicinity of Toika City. However, they landed in an unfamiliar place. Sharon was immediately treated with a spell, and a surprised Kellyan was attacked from behind. The man, turning to his captor, Hosfoy, said that if he stopped now, they could just forget about everything. Unfortunately, the enemy mage had no intention of listening to him, and instead dealt Kellyon a strong blow with his wand. That wasn't the end of it, however, and the man dealt strong blows to the mage time and again, ending the fun only when the blood splashed to the floor. Kellyon knew he couldn't just log off. If had he done so, there is no telling what would have happened to Sharon. It turns out that the men who kidnapped them are doing it all out of pure revenge. Because Kellyon appeared in the tower and won over the professors, they were unable to complete their studies and lost an entire year. If the teachers knew that Kellyon was in fact a player, they would never have allowed his presence in the White Tower. Hosfoy believes that Kellyon's very existence desecrates the name of the Magic Tower. However, this is only a foretaste, and the man after a while goes on to explain what their plan is. They intend to take care of his woman first. Kellyon hearing this, says that Sharon has nothing to do with it, but his reaction only amuses Hosfoy. In the basement of the White Tower there is a laboratory where experiments on homunculus are carried out, and thanks to the fact that Sharon is a player and immortal, she will be able to endure a lot. They will even be able to use it as a training target to evaluate the fighting abilities of new creatures. As for Kellyon himself, according to his captor, he will contribute to their advancement to advanced mages. Saying these words, he orders his subordinates to bring it. A cold shiver runs down Kellyon's back, and he can't believe what he sees. The men brought an artifact called a kaleidoscope, which is so powerful that it's able to open a connection between dimensions. In order to use it you need a medium, and Kellyon will take its place. At the same moment, the sound of a new notification sounded in front of Kellyon's eyes. It was a new hidden task, the content of which was very mysterious. Lunda Barun is located on the continent of Asparagon. You could say it's the holy land of mages, and that's because this is where the White Tower is located. Standing in the main square, Moe's and Kea can't get out of their awe at how grand the city looks. They rightly point out that many things around them use magic. Around the square, there are circles on the ground that catch Moses' attention, and people who stand in them disappear after a while. At the same moment, a suspicious man whispers the name of the device directly into Moses' ear. A terrified Mose jumps back almost suffering a heart attack, and Kia turns into a terrified cat. It turns out that the man's name is Zaire, and he is the envoy of the local information guild. He was sent to the main square because a lot of people have been having trouble finding the guild building lately. After a while, he asks them to let him lead them to the guild. Mose and Kia, however, notice that this man is very strong almost as strong as Prince Lydorn. Having learned by experience, Mose is not about to take his word for it, and asks for proof of Zaire's guild membership. It turns out that Zaire is a homunculus, who was assigned to the guild at the behest of the White Tower, and the tattoo on his face is the best proof. Surprised Mose doesn't quite know what it means, he asks if it's something like an android. Zaire admits that it is something of the sort. He also adds that the creation of such a life form is not easy, but the White Tower magicians were able to do it. In the end, they created the city of Lundabarun. Thanks to them, there are many places in the city that use magic, and the circles in the square are also one of them. Thanks to a giant magic stone underground, 
People can move around the city without using teleportation stones. The man's answer fully satisfies the sorters, and they decide to trust him. After a while, they all stand together in one of the circles, and soon they appear in a completely different part of the city, right in front of the Information Guild building. Wasting no more time, Zaire invites the swordsmen inside, announcing that they are expected by the guild chief. From the conversation held with the head of the guild, it appears that the missing two have indeed been teleported inside the White Tower. Unfortunately, the problem is that there is no way to get inside. The chief explains that the Information Guild can't intervene because the tower is owned by mages. The same goes for the Sanctuary, which is owned by Sorters. The only way to get into the White Tower is to pass an official magical exam. Or at least that's the case officially from the guild leader's perspective. But Zaire believes there is a solution. Gold can take care of everything. So if they want to get to a place that only mages have access to, then all they have to do is find a mage and pay him to take them there. That's why Zaire was assigned to them, to provide unofficial support in their mission. After a while, the man pulled out a crystal ball and contacted someone who was able to set them up with the magician they needed. It turns out that his interlocutor knows someone like that, and gives them the exact location where they can meet him. Soon, all three are heading to the agreed meeting place. At one point, a loud scream can be heard nearby. These were people who supported the recent Lidorn uprising. People who were not happy with the presence of immortals in their world. Zirian quickly explained that they were members of the Lidtel organization, which bases its existence on the ideals of Lidorn. It turns out that the organization is growing at an alarming rate, and just in the past few weeks more than 3 million people have joined, and there are many more overall. Many millions. Tens of millions. Given that Mose is the player who defeated Lidorn, Zirian instructs him to hide his face under the hood. It will be better to avoid them from a distance before things get problematic. Mose agrees, but he can't shake the bitter realization that it shouldn't be like this at all. Not much later, as they follow the road away from the angry crowd, a concerned Kia asks her friend if all is well, and he replies that he is only mildly concerned about what they witnessed. At the same moment, comes the connection to Zirian's crystal ball. Apparently something bad was going on at the Information Guild. The guild was visited by a master swordsman called the Master of Lausvan. Finally, a loud cry of pain came from the crystal ball, followed only by silence. After a while, they heard another voice from the sphere. The mysterious person said he was looking for two sorters from Asparagon. The sorters, called Kia and Mose. Terrified Zirian, unable to believe what he just heard, asks his comrades why someone like Master of Lozvan is looking for them. He asks if they broke the rules of sorters, but Mose immediately denies it, saying that they absolutely did not. Kia adds that if they broke the rule, they would be dealt with by their own master, not a master from another city. The girl believes that they must immediately return to Asparagon. If something has happened, then there they will surely find answers to all their questions. They ask Zirian if he plans to turn them in, but Zirian believes that his mission is to help them get to the tower, and he intends to see it through. Besides, he believes Mose and Kia are much more trustworthy than the people who attack the guild. At the same moment, the girl's attention is caught by something in the distance. When Zirian and Mose follow her gaze and also turn around, their eyes see a bright light focusing on the very top of the White Tower. Seeing what is happening, Zirian shouts that they must find the portal immediately. The mysterious phenomenon on the tower is gaining momentum all the time, and the entire city is flooded with deadly magical fireballs. Only one person calmly walks through the chaos-ridden streets, and Mose also notices it. The mysterious stranger stands alone amid the smoke and flames, and his gaze is clearly focused on Mose. After a moment of silence, he announces that they have finally met. Concerned sorters have no idea who the mysterious stranger is. The man, on the other hand, pulls a teleportation stone from his pocket, and after a while opens two portals through which two other men come out. Arriving through the portals, the warriors kneel before the man, announcing that they have come at the call of the master of Lausvan. Horrified, Kia can't believe what she just heard. The master, on the other hand, says he has been silent for too long, and turned to Mose noticing that he was the one who defeated Lydorn and became famous among other players. Drawing his weapon, the master said that Lydorn was young and stupid, but his convictions were right. The players are the disease that is destroying their world. It was because of this that the Lausvan Sorter made a joint decision. 
Kea, hearing the master's confession, warns them that what they are doing will have serious consequences. However, in their eyes, they are not the ones to blame, but those who don't react when players murder people for no reason, and even they themselves deprived a member of the order of his life just because he broke the rule, and later accepted into their ranks the immortal that is Mose. In the eyes of Laos Van Sorters, this is the real betrayal of the Order's values. They patiently carried out all secret missions, thus ensuring balance in the world. In turn, this fragile balance was destroyed precisely by the Asparagan Sorters. However, the time for talking is over, and the Master Swordsman is preparing to attack. With one mighty leap, the man lands right next to Mose in a split second. Fortunately, the hero had time to react and summoned one of his swords in time to parry the deadly blow. Or at least it seemed that way. But in reality, the impact was so strong that despite the successful block, it still inflicted massive damage, and blood gushed from Mose's mouth. Terrified, Kia wanted to help him. But at the same moment, another of the sorters launched an attack taking aim at her. The girl managed to avoid the fatal blow and the whole combination that came right after it. The elf managed to jump back gaining some distance, but that wasn't the end of the attack at all. The enemy sworder gathered energy in the blade of his sword and fired straight at the girl. At the same moment, Zaire joined the fight, and using a spell, successfully blocked the incoming attack. However, there were more opponents. The third of the enemy sworders used his skill, and spikes coming out of the ground flashed toward them with incredible speed. Zaire failed to react in time, and one of the spikes nearly decapitated him. Sorters immediately ran to check his condition. It became clear that if their opponents were only two weaker fighters, then the three of them would be able to win. Unfortunately, no matter what they did, they would not be able to defeat the Master Sorter. They realized they had to flee, and Zaire decided to lead them to the nearest teleport. His special ability hidden in his eyes allows him to take control of the enemy for a short while. With it, he will be able to hold the master in place, and they will be able to run safely to the teleport. Unfortunately, due to the damage received, the activation time of the skill has been extended, and Zaire needs as much as three minutes to prepare it. During this time, they will have to lure the master as far away from the teleport as possible, and as soon as he can use the skill, they will all run together immediately to the one closest to them. Zaire's skill will allow him to immobilize the enemy for half a second. Kia pointed out that this might not be enough, but they really had no other option, because facing the enemy directly, they would surely die. Their discussion was interrupted by the master, who was slowly walking toward them. The man noticed that Zaire was a homunculus and concluded that the White Tower wasn't idle. At the same moment, there was a powerful tremor that covered the entire city, and immediately afterward, the flare located on a nearby tower grew to even greater proportions. Mose immediately asked the master if this was also his doing, but the man replied that he had nothing to do with what magicians do, although in his opinion, it had something to do with a player. Whenever something bad or unexpected happened, it involved an immortal. Mose couldn't understand why the man was so ominous about the players, so he asked the master if it was because of his personal experience. Hearing the question coming from Mose's mouth, the man only smiled slightly. It turned out that when he performed a mission as a novice sorter 17 years ago, he was assigned to a certain village whose residents were extremely grateful to them for solving their problems. Unfortunately, this village no longer exists today, and that's because of the player's guild that was established there. The people living in the village were forced to relocate to nearby mountains, to the areas where bloodthirsty trolls swarmed. It wasn't long before all the villagers were brutally deprived of their lives. It was this situation that solidified Master of Lausvan's belief that gamers are the disease that is destroying this world. At one point, Kia stood between Mose and the Master. She admitted that what he says may actually be true because since the players came to their world, many bad things have happened, and the balance itself has been disrupted thanks to their immortality. However, the player at whom the Master directs his blade is none other than Mose. That is, the player who, with his own hands, fought against those who were responsible for the evil deeds. Moe single-handedly did much more in the fight against them than anyone else. In the girl's eyes, the master was simply directing his anger at the closest player. After a while, the man agreed that arguing about someone else's ideologies is completely pointless, and that because it's the winner's ideology that becomes the ultimate truth. 
After saying these words, the master assumed a fighting stance. The swordsmen did the same in response, then immediately attacked together. Mo sent out his swords, and Kia moved on the enemy. The man easily deflected the legendary blade sent in his direction, and just as the elf's blow was about to reach its target, the man prepared to counterattack. Mo's, however, knew it was too dangerous, and sent one of his swords straight between them. At that point, however, something changed. The master assumed an unusual fighting stance, and a terrifying and extremely powerful aura began to seep from his body. Mose noted that the technique was strangely similar to quickly pulling a sword from its scabbard. Zaire, who was standing behind, warned an elf woman of the impending attack, and at the same moment, Master of Lausvan used his terrifying skill. Black energy appeared all around him and began to mercilessly destroy and consume everything in the area. Thanks to the warning, Kia managed to dodge the deadly skill at the last moment, but knocked back by the sheer power of the shockwave, she rolled on the ground. The strength of Master of Lausvan's skill was truly frightening. Moreover, the man was ready to continue fighting. At the same moment, Zaire's prepared skill was activated. This brief moment was their only chance to escape the battlefield and save their lives. So much for parts 1 through 5. Comment below part 6, if you want me to do the next part. For the time being, we've gone through all the chapters currently released, so the next part won't be made until a few months from now. In the meantime, thank you very much for watching my recaps, and if you like what I'm doing please subscribe and send the link to your friends. I will be really grateful for any help. Thanks again for watching and see you in the next episode.